Hello, everyone. We are in the house. Uh, this is James from My Take On Reality, and we have a very special, special, special guest right over here. This is Jenny from See Your Perspective. I'm super excited. Welcome, Jenny. Say Thank hi. You. Give the people what they want. Give the people what they want. Thank you so much, James. I am tickled pink to be here. People have been <laughs> saying on my channel for forever, ever since it started, basically, are you going to collab with James? <laughs> So I am stoked to be here. I'm very excited. Thank you for the invite. And um, no, it's my no honor. Worries. No, it's my pleasure. I'm a huge fan of your uh, show. I enjoy a lot of the stuff that you put out. And, and it's always very detailed, very organized. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty amazing. So I'm super excited about having you on the, on the uh, live stream. It's going to be exciting, especially because we're going over Becoming Sister Wives, mm -hmm. which is uh, the intro book for those who don't know this is the book that uh introduces america to the sister wives and their story before they became sister wives and were actually on the show and all that so this is the times before and so it's really interesting especially now when we look back on where we are now versus how they started because when they first came out i gotta tell you they were a different animal altogether <laughs> They were a different animal altogether because they came off like, oh, we all love each other, respect each other. It's amazing. The relationships <laughs> are bonded. And, and we can't, I have a huge family. And now it's just very cutthroat. So yeah. it's, a, it's a little different. It's a little different, needless to say. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, we'll be going over last week. We talked about the, uh, we went over the prologue uh, that was written by Cody where he came out and he basically introduced himself as a superstar, <laughs> superstar <laughs> who was sitting on the side of the, uh, the lounge and he's not one of the Hollywood big wigs, but he's being introduced as one. So we got a little taste of that. In this chapter, we're going to be talking about matrimony. This is how Cody and Mary actually first got together, their thoughts on each other and how their relationship came together. And essentially, in many ways, this is the genesis of the family mm -hmm. because they are, in fact, the uh, foundation or the cornerstone of the Brown family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. So uh, with all that being said, what were your thoughts about the chapter overall? Uh, did you have any thoughts about it? Um, I have so many thoughts, James. <laughs> awesome, awesome. I like a lot of thoughts. I Overall... The going back, and, and I'm new to reading this too. This is, you know, just in the past couple of weeks have started going through the book. I am shocked by how much love Cody is professing in mm -hmm. the chapter to Mary, especially because he wrote this after Robin entered the family. So, like, if he would have written this back before the whole show and all of that, then that would make sense to me. But they were having a difficult time in their marriage prior mm -hmm. to Robin coming into the family. And right. then he comes in, and then they get married, and then a couple years later they write it. So that's really what shocked me the most, that he would still have these professions of love for her cut to season 18 right, right. <laughs> where he claims he never loved her right. or any of the other wives. So, you know, knowing he put that in print, I mean, right. <laughs> it doesn't exist thinking. anymore. Yeah he, well, it was before back, social media. yeah. he needs to go back and read his own book. <laughs> right. Right. Well, it was before social media. So, you know, if it didn't happen on YouTube, Instagram, it didn't happen on the gram. It didn't happen. I think that's kind of the approach he was yeah. taking. Good point, and, and James. Good point. Yeah. And and also because that was so long ago and kind of before all of this social media stuff, where there's so many sleuths out there who are way better than me. You say I do investigative right. stuff. I get so many more comments and replies on my videos of like stuff that I I just want to pull my hair out and redo all my videos because I get more and more information from people. I'm like, I wish I would have included that. But now, like they didn't think back then when they were writing all this stuff that we were going to be able to come back and, and fact check a lot of right. it. Right. And, I, and I'm sure that when it first started, 
they there's no way that they could have predicted that the show itself was going to be as popular right. and as long lasting as it has been. Mm-hmm. So when they were putting it out, you know, this is like I've I've referred to uh, the TLC show for the most part as the polygamy propaganda program. <laughs> I love and that. I <laughs> That's pretty much how they have always kind of handled it. It was mm-hmm. the best foot forward. We want to present the most idealistic version of polygamy possible where everybody is in love, everybody is treated equally, everybody is getting everything they need. And this, in fact, is the perfect family. So it's, it goes beyond just like, oh, we just kind of all get along and we came together as one. Mm-hmm. It's almost to the point of this is the Brady Bunch polygamy mm-hmm. style, mm-hmm. you know? And I think that that's what they were going for. And so with that being said, he couldn't come out and say, yeah, the first marriage was a complete failure. Mm-hmm. And I did it two more times. And now I found the one, you know, after the fourth one, I found the one I kind of like. Like, it's it's mm-hmm. just not a good, it's good a story. Mm-hmm. Or it's good a storyline. Mm-hmm. You're right. That is a really good point. Because by like season three-ish, around the time this book came out, they were still a 100% on the bandwagon of, you know, we're the Brady Bunch. And right. everything is great here with these bringing these families together. It is kind of like a modern day Brady Bunch when you think about it, right, right, right. <laughs> bringing different families together. Um, and but it just, yeah, 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 it, it, it just disintegrated so much. And I sometimes wonder if Christine had a big hand in that because she was the only one right from the get go who would just say like, "Hmm, I'm not sure about this new, you know, right from season one, she was the only one that had a little bit of pushback, not a lot of pushback, but a little bit of pushback. Right. So I wonder if had it not been for Christine, they probably would have ridden that wave for the longest time of hiding. Absolutely. um, Really what was going on in their family. Right. And I think that's a great point too. Oh, big shout out to, uh, Veggie Blue with the dollar ninety nine super chat. Thank you so much. Cody was buttering Mary up for divorce via book. Mm, there you go. <laughs> so good at uh, Mega Blue. <laughs> Cody was doing a long game. He was playing a long game. He was making sure that Mary felt comfortable right before he hit her with the key box in the form of paperwork. Yeah. Um, the, the I think there, the, there's an interesting point by start talking about uh, Cody. Uh, having the disagreement with Christine and setting that up early Mm -hmm. because I've always held that my contention has always been, and this is no disrespect to anybody involved because this type of relationship to me is expert level operations as far as how to conduct relationships and marriages. Mm -hmm. Like you, you would have to be an emotionally intelligent, almost genius level emotional intelligence You have to have compassion, empathy. You have to have immense patience, almost to the point of like, you know, just ridiculousness in order for you to make this type of relationship work. Almost to the point where I I question whether it's possible, not saying it's not possible, but I question whether it can be done properly or done 100 Mm percent. And with Christine, I've always held that with her, she's in a position where she was the first indication, at least to me when I'm watching the show that this doesn't work because a lot of the things that she complains about stems from the fact that she's hurt Mm -hmm. and it stems from a place of pain. Mm -hmm. So because she's jealous and she's envious and she, she wants, she's angry at a lot of the things that are happening and people are looking at her like it's her fault. But a lot of that stems from the fact that she's just upset and not happy with her relationship. Mm. You know, Mm -hmm. if you have friends that are in relationships and they're not getting along with their spouse or their boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, or their significant other, they will take it out on other people in Mm -hmm. some cases. And I think that that's kind of a manifestation of what happened with Christine. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's it's, uh, I think it's very interesting that you pointed that out that uh, early on, even she was like she was kind of bucking back on the system. (laughs) Yeah. Well, James, that's what got me hooked. Really, at the beginning, as soon as I saw Christine, she was the first person on the series that I related to. Because Mm. when she would have interviews in that and be like, I don't really know. And, uh, you know, everyone's all gung ho about this, but I'm not really sure. And in that little snarky time when she's like, she must, well, she just must be amazing or something like that. I was just like, 
oh, this is going to go down. Okay. Like I instantly connected with her and thought, yeah, y'all have been together for over a decade. And all of a sudden this new chick's going to come in. How is that right. going to work? And clearly, you know, I it mean, <laughs> it just seems obvious to everybody in the world that it's not going to work well, but except for right. Cody and, I think the other wives just kind of went along because they so bought into the principle of it that and, right. and they succumb in the end to what Cody says, which Christine did as well. Um, right. But I, I love that she at least gave us a little bit of it because, you know, that back then that was her holding back. Mm -hmm. You know, at the beginning, right. she was all about uh, um just recently she shared uh, or um McKelty shared on her Patreon that her mom's favorite movie is Frozen because of that whole let it go and her whole life it was like conceal don't reveal um just put on a happy face and and be pleasant all the time and so that movie just makes her cry because it was sort of like that breakaway now where she can just be herself. And, and she said that multiple times about Cody, too. Like the house had to be a certain way. She had to have food done a certain way. And he's very critical of her a lot. He makes right. fun of her throughout the seasons. And she just laughs it off. And I'm just like, what the heck? He just insulted right. you. What are you doing? So, so knowing all that... Her, those little snarky comments and her just sort of saying, I'm not so sure about this. That's her withholding. Right, I'm just thinking right. what was really going through her mind back then. That was the holding back. And I, that's actually interesting because I think that that's one of the uh, challenges. Because as we uh, kind of talked about last week, we're going out through the prologue. Mm -hmm. And even with reflective of the UNLV uh, anthropologist that came down and he talked about the roles of each wife, mm -hmm. Christine's role was not to be fulfilled as a complete person. She's merely an image of a characteristic of a type of person mm. that Cody was willing to pull in and use almost as a card. You filled this role for me. Mm -hmm. So with Janelle, you have the business wife. I can sit there and talk about business and finances and paying the bills. Mary mm. is the foundational wife. She kind of keeps everything in order. She keeps the, uh, all the wives in line and she keeps the family moving forward. And with Christine, you had the fun time wife, the relaxed wife, the yeah. easygoing wife. And the problem with, with being locked into any of those, those characteristics, even in our daily relationships, is that once you get locked into that role or somebody categorizes you a certain way, you can never break free from that. Mm -hmm. And the moment you start to try to break free from it, then it becomes problematic. All of a sudden, I'm hanging out. You, Cody's hanging out down at Christine's house. And she wants to start talking about bills. No, I don't talk about bills with you. You're not the bill wife. Yeah. You're the fun wife. Why are you coming to me with problems? Mm -hmm. And that's where I think uh, Robin actually later on, uh, I've always taken a position that that's where Robin actually has an advantage because she's the place of no problems. Mm -hmm. So when he goes over Robin's house, she's even said, I'm going to maintain the honeymoon environment. Mm -hmm. So when he comes over, he can just let, sit back, lay back and enjoy the kids. Don't bother him. Mm -hmm. There's no problems. There's no pressure. I'll figure it out by myself, whatever the case may be. And he gets to come over here on vacation. And who doesn't like vacation love? And that's where what she provided. And I think that that's also a major component as to why he felt so close to her. Mm -hmm. Because she made him feel that way. Yeah. And she provided that to him. As meanwhile, Christine's starting to buck up and she's starting to say, say stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she's starting to create problems. And he's like, I don't want the problems. And that's where I think some of the problems with them started to stem from. Yes, so, yes. You know, there's yeah. a lot of interesting dynamics in these relationships, I think. It's interesting to think about the fact that Okay, so right away at the beginning, like you said, everyone had their roles. And Christine was kind of the fun one. Mary was, you know, Mary, who Mary was the OG, basically. Right. She was kind of right. the leader, leader of it all, um, starting to cause some problems with Cody. And so, and as we know now, before they even got married, he's sharing all kinds of stuff with Robin about what was going on with those wives. So Robin decided. I'm going to be the sexy time one, <laughs> right, right? you know, right. like I know what I need to do to be the best, most preferred wife. 
Um, and I'm not going to tell anybody that I'm just, I have my own role that I'm going to, that I'm going to fill. Um, so in some ways she's devious and brilliant in that way, because I mean, it's true. What's a way to a man's heart <laughs> besides food? <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes you ain't got to eat. <laughs> <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but I think that that's an interesting point because when when you look at their the dynamics of their relationships and uh, YouTube is my time machine awesome what's up YouTube is my time machine how you doing uh five dollars super chat hello hello uh mm -hmm. Cody didn't hide the disparity between the other wives and Robin that's what was obvious to, to Christine and I think that that's true I think that Cody uh kind of in line with what I was about to say I think that Cody understood. That, or at least he believed that these relationships were cemented. That they couldn't leave if they wanted to leave. Like you can't go anywhere. So he took them for granted, and based on the fact that he took them for granted, opened the door for him to actually create more of a chasm between himself and these women. And then after COVID happened, and they realized, and the truth of the matter is, COVID killed a lot of things, including these marriages, because once it hit these women were left to their own devices because he had separated himself from them. And they started to realize something which was mysterious and wonderful at the same time, which was that they could do it by themselves. And once they came to that realization that they could start doing these things by themselves and they didn't necessarily need a man right. to help them and carry them through, all of a sudden it became realistic for them to be able to walk out the door. And that's where Cody, I think, ultimately wound up losing his wives. But for COVID, I don't think that they would have left because if they wouldn't have came to their realization that they could do it by themselves, and they might have actually stuck around and him treating them any way he wants would have been okay. Yeah. And that's no, I agree with you. And you did a video on that just recently. And I it was like an aha moment for you for me. And I'm like, you're absolutely right. You came out and said Christine realized because she was always so mm. dependent on him and, you know, and she just kind of towed the line and tried to be the happy one. But you were right. Absolutely. When you said this was the realization, like he shot himself in the foot by keeping right. himself away from them. Cause as soon as he did that, those wives are like, wait a minute, I got this, especially Christine. <laughs> now I think yeah. Janelle always kind of knew it, but she still wanted to buy into it, you know, because she just sort of liked the whole idea of it all. And Mary, also really was committed to the principle. She just kept saying, like, I just made this commitment and I thought it was for eternity. I don't know why she wanted to be with him for eternity. It just makes no sense to me when he was so mean to her. I'm like, this, right. is he going to change who he is when he gets to heaven? I don't know. But anyway, she really was committed to it for the longest time, whereas Christine was kind of like, this is not what I signed up for. And right. then once she realized she could do it on her own, just like you said, it was, oh, okay, goodbye. I don't need you. Right. I can stay friends with the rest of these. These kids will always be my kids because she raised right. them more than any of the wives did. So she knew she would be close with them and they would be close with her. And she knew she'd be close with Janelle too. That's all she needed. And then she was right. out. So it's sort of like she needs to thank Cody for his ridiculous COVID rules and for him just isolating himself and Robin and her family, calling it my house, not taking care of any of the other kids, but always being there for them. You know, the whole Isabel thing that I mean, like just wasn't around. Truly's down the street, hadn't seen her in forever, doesn't go to see Janelle and, and the boys. The boys are desperate and pleading to be with them. And with all that, he says no. And then they were kind of like, well, okay. All right. right. That's where we are. I guess you're yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. If that's how you want it. All right. Okay. And now he's <laughs> upset because they said, okay. <laughs> I can't believe you left when I told you to get out. <laughs> I know. It was maddening watching that, wasn't it? And I'm like, that's yeah. what you've been telling. Oh, I'm good. the amount of things I wanted to throw up my television. It, I just can't afford another <laughs> one. So I didn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> Like, this is crazy. Yeah, it was, it's one of those uh, things that I think that this is one of the challenges that uh, a lot of folks hit, especially as you become like more mature in your relationships. Uh, that's mm -hmm. a polite way to say you start getting older. But <laughs> as you become more, more, mature, more mature in your relationships, it's, it's uh, easier 
to take those relationships for granted because we've been together. We've always been together. So therefore we will always be together. And one of the things that I've always kind of talked about was when you're in relationships, you always have to keep a sense of humility in the sense that you, every day you wake up and the other person wake up, you're each choosing to be in that situation. And when you look at it from that perspective, even though you've been together for 20 years, tomorrow may be the day they just, you know what, I'm I'm kind of done with this. I'm, I've mm-hmm. lived this part of my life on to the new and I'm gonna put you in my rear view. So mm-hmm. if you can, if you can humiliate, not humiliate yourself, but if you can humble yourself to recognize that you are the end all be all and the consistency that they have to have in their life, that you're merely a choice that they're making on a daily basis, then that I think, reinvigorate you to continue to try in your relationships and not allow things to become stale and boring. And you, you just assume that they're going to be around no matter how you treat them, no matter what you say to them, no matter how much you disrespect them, you just assume they're going to be there because when you do that, it creates a pathway for problems to happen and a separation to occur. Yeah. And I think that that's where, where a lot of what happened with uh, Christine and, and uh, even the other wives kind of came into play. Janelle, like you said, she was in a different pers- position because I think she enjoyed the freedom of having this type of relationship. She enjoyed the companionship when she wanted to have it. It was manageable because she could flash in and flash out. She didn't have to do it on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. Then she could focus on herself. Then she could do the relationship thing when she wanted. Then she could focus back on herself. Mm-hmm. So I think she enjoys that aspect of it. But the, it starts to beg the question of: Is that Cody, or is that just the is that just the relationship dynamic that she's used to? Right. You yeah. Know? I she um, confused me in um, season eighteen because the entire time everybody would refer to um, their relationship as like a, a real close intellectual one, one that, you know, mm. they just, um, sh- they can, she, d- she takes care of the finances. He can run things by her. They can talk business. They can, and that's, she sort of the, the calm. He really enjoys her because he enjoys that intellectual stimulation and all that. And they really, for years to me, imply there really wasn't much happening in the bedroom, that it was more of a a convenience. You're the father of my kids and we kiss and, you know, but it's like, you know, I'm good. I don't need that. I need my alone time. I need to go to the movie theater when Christine's watching the kids. I'm just like, I, I, this is, this is good for me. Let me make all the money. And, and then, Uh you know, you're there as sort of my companion, my confidant, my, you know, like that kind of relationship I felt Felt like it developed into over the years and they would say things to imply that but then season 18 in those like talkbacks and everything and it was right. just sort of like i'm like maybe she does get a freak on because yeah, <laughs> yeah. i was thinking like why is she staying she's not getting that like emotional touching connection to him but i'm uh, like maybe she was and maybe that's why she stuck around as long as she did i don't know i don't know but now well, i'm all confused about janelle i really don't know i would love for somebody to spill well it would have to be janelle um i would love love for her to spill the beans at some point and just really say because Christine and Mary have been very forthright about when mm. intimacy ended in in their relationship and I thought for Janelle it ended way in the beginning too but now I don't know I I'm confused no. after season 18 I think because uh Janelle is a lady in the streets and a freak of the sheets because <laughs> <laughs> She just might be. I'm thinking that's possible. You might be right, I James. Think, I think she's a quiet stormer. Like she's the one that everybody just assumed wasn't doing anything. Oh, she ain't doing nothing. Mm-hmm. She don't, she turned his back out. Like this dude was because he was sprung. Like when he showed up, you can see the hurt in his face because he thought he was getting right back in mm-hmm. to the, uh, the fun ride, which was Janelle. But he was met with that resistance. Like I'm kind of okay with the way the relationship is now. Huh? What? <laughs> You mean I'm not coming back to the house? Right. This is right. That's golden. Everything. That's like up there in my top three moments of Sister Wives was right. his reaction when she's like, 
I think I want to stay separated for a while. Right, right. You know, I just did a bunch of push-ups. I was drinking orange juice all day. <laughs> Trying to get my strength together. <laughs> oh, boy, was it a husband? He was in trouble. But I think that that's one of the things that, uh, like, like I think that that actually revealed some, some semblance of how things kind of work, too. Even in the dating market where... You have people who are very outspoken about all that they do, and they're very braggadocious about how good they are and how much they get, and this, that, and other. And it's the quiet ones you got to watch out for. Yeah, it's yeah. The ones that don't talk about it. And it because could ones- also be, you know, it seems like Robin's had it out for Janelle. From the, I mm. mean, she had it out for Christine for a different reason, but she never really got along with Janelle's kid. You know, she always had something against right. the boys, that family. Um, maybe Robin was aware that Janelle was providing something that maybe she couldn't. So as hard as she right. was trying, Janelle still had her special something that she yeah. did for Cody that he wasn't getting from Robin. And that might have just really bothered her. It could be. Yeah, it could have been that uh, hard conversation where he looks over at her and be like, you know, Janelle does blah, 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 mm-hmm. blah. Mm-hmm. You should talk to her mm-hmm. about how she, et cetera, et cetera. And that's actually kind of an interesting point because I think that later on what we'll see even throughout the show is that, like you said, there are po- pressure points that she goes after Janelle with mm-hmm. that she doesn't really do with the other wives. Like she, she goes after Janelle's kids. Mm-hmm. You know, when she when she went after uh, Hunter because he wasn't excited and doing backflips because she announced that she was pregnant and right. the kids yeah. weren't excited. Janelle wasn't excited either because yeah. Janelle understood what the finances look like. And for you right. to come in and start talking about, hey, guys, we're having another baby. So we're going to have more people to feed more you know, mm-hmm. more things to purchase, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And we'll have more responsibilities overall as a family. Mm-hmm. And Janelle had that response. But she focused, she hyper focused on uh, the other children. So. I think that was an interesting thing. Yeah, um, yeah. She was. She really had a distorted view of how that all went down. I don't know if she ever went back and and rewatched it or not. But mm-hmm. I mean, her saying none of the kids were happy in that. Christine's kids were very happy. Christine went up like that in two seconds, but she also held right. that against Christine. She would bring that up when she would mention things she didn't like about Christine and like, and how the kids were, none of the kids were happy. I'm like, that's not true. But Janelle, she's smart because Robin just came with three kids in tow. So they just added four mouths to a budget that was so thinly stretched with no additional income. Robin didn't offer anything. And there was that one scene on, and I don't remember what season it was where near the beginning where Robin said, Oh, I just hope the other wives see my value here. You know, because I E I I didn't get a job like everyone else has a job, you know, what's your value. You're not watching the other kids. You're not even watching your own. You have to pay for nanny. Like, you know, like I I don't think they did see the value in you from the beginning, but yeah, Janelle, she was onto it right away. You know, she was sort of like, I do the books and we are barely mm. scraping by with four additional mouths with no income. And now we're going to add a fifth. Mm. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, because actually that was a uh, season one, episode two, I think, where she had said that by season, I think it was episode, no, maybe uh, three or four, because she had already moved to, uh, to Utah. Yeah. Yeah. She, she was living in Utah at the time. And she was, I remember she was sitting there eat, eating like the barbecue food that they had made during a picnic. And she's like, I just want to have a great job and show that I'm bringing value. And in, at that point, Janelle, Janelle said, well, you know, she's looking for a job and she's going to find a job and she's going to start working and she'll start contributing. I was like, oh, if you only knew. I know. You know 14 <laughs> years later, she's still looking for that job. Yeah, that elusive <laughs> job is hiding. Like, <laughs> Apparently it's hiding in the job application section. Like, yeah. <laughs> don't want it. She was like, I'm not going to classified. I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, the, I think that that always was there. And then, but, and that's one of the things initially I thought might have been a problem for Janelle in the, uh, uh, or at least uh, created friction between Janelle and Robin was the fact that Janelle was aware of how much money was being spent. Mm-hmm. And the fact that, like you said, she shows up, she has three kids in tow. So I'm taking care of you and your kids mm-hmm. coming into a family where we are already struggling to get by and try to figure out bills. Mm-hmm. And you're bringing in four additional people. And then you show up talking about you pregnant and want me to be excited about it. 
Right. Like, I, I write the checks. I know what, where it's going, where. And I know at, at that time, they had, uh, when she came and said she was pregnant, they were still in rental homes. Mm-hmm. And she had cashed in her 401k. Janelle had cashed in her 401k. And that's how they were paying for things. And this between the 401k and the show money. Mm-hmm. And again, you don't know how long the show was going to go. Because it could have been canceled. Because it wasn't that long after they got to... Uh, Vegas that they were talking about canceling the show. Yeah. So, no, yeah, that's true. And you know, at the beginning, I don't know how many year contract they had, but isn't they're not going to have extended contracts at the beginning. They're just testing it out. So right. the whole notion of bringing Robin in right at the beginning, there was no guarantee of money past that first season until they signed on again. They, they're not going to do a multi-year deal right at the beginning. The first one definitely was just for a year. And then even then it was, you know, it was kind of a slow going season in terms of of ratings and that for a while. But I was hooked right from the beginning, even when it was like Mm. watching paint dry for some reason. It just they just fascinated me. I've been fascinated by this family from the from jump. Yeah, it's very different. And I I think that, too, like it's also keeping in, in mind, like between entertainment contracts, the way that they're laid out. The uh, reality show contracts versus uh, standard production uh, Mm -hmm. contracts are completely different. They're worlds apart. Like Mm -hmm. the reality show contracts are extremely sparse, which is part of the attraction for production companies to make reality shows Mm -hmm. because they pay you for the content that you film or the content that's aired. Mm -hmm. They don't pay you for the days that you show up and film. Mm -hmm. Like if you work on a movie set or a television show, Every day you show up, hell, if you show up for filming, you get paid. You show up to get a fitting for wardrobe, you get paid. Mm-hmm. You show up to do a table read, you get paid. Everything, everything that you do, you get you get a check mm-hmm. surrounding your day or time that you put in. Mm-hmm. When you're doing a reality show, you don't get paid until the end of the season, depending on what episode you you appear on. Mm-hmm. That that allots how much you get paid. From that, and even then, it's only the one time. In most cases, unless they have some special deal on Sister Wives, mm-hmm. usually it's just the one season that you get paid for. And whereas, if you work a traditional uh, production, you get royalty checks. Mm-hmm. So if you're on a show like Sister Wives, has been on forever, and they have it shooting all over Discovery Plus, Max, and different mm-hmm. places and platforms, you would be getting a check from each one of those places right. that license the show. And there's a possibility that they aren't getting that. They're just getting next season's check. No, I think you're right. And I think I recently just heard that there is some sort of lawsuit where a bunch of people in the reality team, I think uh, Bethany Frankel might be spearheading it actually, but they're trying to get some legislation, uh, legislation, but like... uh, uh, picket or boycott or, you know, like right now they're just writing letters. Um for on behalf of reality TV talent, because you're right, they're not getting royalties for right. all the times. I mean, when I mean, they'd make a mint off of the number of times I've had to go back and rewatch things or pull things for clips and all that. Yeah, I've been and right. all the commercials you have to sit through. Uh, I'm so used to watching everything in my DVR and fast forwarding all the commercials. So like, it just drives me mad that I'm like three more minutes. I mean, I, I, I probably have like an entire day of my life in the past few months where I've just <laughs> sat through commercials on TLC. So yeah, they are making TLC is making a ton of money off of me. But yeah, none right. of none of the Brown family is is getting any of those residuals. Yeah, it doesn't trickle down, and that's one of the, the uh, it's one of the, the blessings and the curses because because they don't have to do that on reality shows. You don't have to pay for writers. I mean, if you do pay for a writer, they may do light script direction, but mm-hmm. the, or storyline direction, but they're not writing out entire scripts and storylines. You know, with plot points you know, conflict, et cetera, et cetera. You, mm-hmm. You're not paying the production staff to be smaller. The film crew could be smaller. Mm-hmm. And it, it's a, it's, you know, they're shooting kind of commando. Whereas if you have a bigger production, a lot like, yeah, key grips and, and all kinds of stuff going on behind the scenes. The production team is way bigger. The production itself is way bigger. Mm-hmm. And like I said, you fall under uh, SAG-AFTRA mm-hmm. uh, for those appearances, which would entitle you because it's a union they entitle you to certain protections, yeah. even on set. Like there are certain protections that you're guaranteed on set that you can't show up and 
you know, on a reality show, they can show up and say, hey, this season, uh, we want you to take your clothes off. Mm-hmm. You know, I need you to take your clothes off and we're going to film you. And uh, on a SAG on a SAG set, if you show up and they say, hey, we want you to take your clothes off, surprise, if it's not in your contract and you didn't agree to it, you can walk off and you can pick the phone up and call a rep. Mm-hmm. And that they'll change it. You know, mm-hmm. or, or they'll be penalized for, for mm-hmm. even asking you to do it. And they mm-hmm. have everything that they ask you to do, you get paid for it. Yeah. So if they ask you to, if you play the guitar, you play a musical instrument, you get a bump and pay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you drive in a car, you get a bump and pay. Yeah. And they don't do that in reality shows. You, you know, when Cody pulled up on his little dirt bike out there on a county pass, <laughs> he'd have got extra money. <laughs> <laughs> his million dollar dirt bike. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, you're right. And the ironic, and I know we're getting off topic here, so I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll just say this, and then I won't yeah. continue. But the the ironic part about it, I don't know if it's ironic is necessarily the word, but maybe the sad part about it is that the actor strike back, well, what was it a decade ago, maybe more? Now um, there was that huge actors strike because of con- the inequities and too long of hours and residual. There was just a whole bunch involved in it. And um, no, it wasn't actor strike. I'm sorry. It was a writer strike. It was a writer the strike. Writer's guild. It was yeah. a writer strike. Yeah. Um, a, a long time ago, not the most recent one, but the one before that was what led into reality TV. Cause they didn't have, they started doing all the stuff they had in the can and bringing it out. And then eventually they didn't have anything left in the can. They were bringing out stuff that they weren't even going to air that like, eh, I don't know. And they put it on a shelf. They were putting that out. Everything was going on TV until they didn't have anything else. So that's the birth of really reality TV, because this is something right. that they, they didn't need writers for. So they could just go shoot people and then put it all together with the editors and, and get it out there. So yeah, the sad part about it is they got what they deserved in the end, but then there weren't nearly as many writing jobs because in reality right. TV kind of took off and became its own, its own thing. So yeah, that's kind of the, the yeah. history of that. Yeah. All right. We better get into the book. Before I know. <laughs> they like, I took it in to find out about coming. Sister wives, all they talk about is, is busted out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we busted up marriages, yeah, yeah, but, uh, yeah. So in the uh, in the first part, like I guess, th- like I said, this is uh, talk about from the book's perspective. For those who are uh, keeping up, we're doing becoming sister wives. I'll try to put it in the light, but um, we're, we're talking about the uh, first chapter, which is matrimony, and in that first chapter, there are some some uh, key things that I thought were. There's a lot of stuff that's, uh, to me, very interesting mm-hmm. in how it's presented. Um, let's see. So I guess from page 15 on the, in the second thing where we talk about, like, uh, Mary's mom pushed polygamy mm-hmm. onto the family. Uh, it says, uh, it was my mother who urged my father to take his first poor wife. Mm-hmm. He did, and she joined the family when I was only five. But, <laughs> but there's always a but, mm-hmm. but marriage with no children and she left two years later. So there's that, uh, I, I kind of highlighted that and you can add to it or, or maybe you found something different or earlier. But uh, the reason why I thought that that was interesting because in keeping with the idea of this being the uh, polygamy propaganda program, one of the main tenets of them pushing this out has always been it's the women's choice. Mm. It's the women who spearhead this. It's the women who guide it. It's the women who want it. The guys kind of go along with what the women are pushing out. Mm -hmm. And we're just simply there as vessels, but it's the women who are the main movers and main drivers for this, this family and familial activity. And so when we talk about Mary, uh, they talked about it previously with Cody talking about like how smart his women are, wives are and how they drive and how he doesn't really get to decide anything, which is contrary to his position. And I'll never get to decide another. When have I ever got into family and made a decision? You know, later on in uh, season seven, I want to say it is around there. But uh, the uh, difference is, is that initially Mary does the same thing when she talks about how her mom had introduced polygamy to her family and how she, even as the first wife, 
and somebody who kind of pushed Cody into the whole idea of having a polygamous marriage. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was the moms who did it. Even later on when Cody talks about it, it was his mother Mm -hmm. who talked to him about polygamy and then talked to him about adding another wife to the family and then talked to him about being excommunicated because they wanted to pursue polygamy Mm -hmm. and how important polygamy was. So, so uh, what are your thoughts on that, uh, on that issue? Well, it blows my mind because <laughs> just as a female, I can't wrap my brain around how anybody could even be a part of it, nor less initiate it and say, hey, this is a great idea, especially because what I find interesting, and, and uh, I think, I don't know if it was Mary who mentioned it or Cody, because we kind of went back and forth about both of them sort of switching over, you know, we kind of had both their stories on, on how they uh, went into the AUB from the LDS church. But in all reality, even though they had to leave the LDS church and it was a big deal because they had to leave the church behind, it, they didn't. It's the exact same faith. It's just like LDS plus. <laughs> right. It's like we have this, it's a huge plus. It's a big plus. Um, and I get why the LDS church is like, no, we're separating ourselves from you now. That was our history. We're trying to break off from our history. We are no longer believing in that tenant. And so we will, you know, we, we cut you off if you, mm. um, if you do that. Um, but I just found it fascinating the whole concept of polygamy with Joseph Smith, you know, it was a man whose idea originally was um, and then and talked everybody into it. So now that we have these females and we see the same thing on Seeking Sister Wives, right, that we have right. these females who are like, I, you know, I think this the Salhuddin family is one of them. And um, it's I, I brought it to you. I can't, I just can't understand it. I really, I can't, I accept it. I believe them, but I can't comprehend how any female would say, I think this is a great idea that you find somebody else to have as a wife as well. Mm -hmm. Unless I was married to somebody who I didn't really like that much. And I felt like I can't get out of the marriage. Like then I could see it. Like if I really believed that, this was a covenant and um, I'm breaking a covenant with God by divorcing this man. And and you really are so strong in that part of the faith that I must remain married to him, but I don't like him. (laughs) And I really don't want to be with him anymore. And he kind of annoys me now, you know, abuse, that's a whole separate thing, but I just mean like, I'm kind of over him. Um, Then I could see like, I can't divorce him. So this is what I'm going to (laughs) do. I'm gonna, right, right. I'm gonna get him somebody else. I'll still be around. <laughs> I'm gonna get him out the house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna get him out the I'll house. Be busy. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, because I think that that's part of it. Like that's one of the uh, things that it's for a lot of folks who are watching the show. And I think that part of what intrigued a lot of people to watch the show in the beginning, especially, and became so fascinated with it, was the very idea or concept that you are comfortable with sharing your husband with another woman. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the fact that you're sharing your husband, because that actually can, you know, as the sister wives later do, they kind of break it down that it's just being a sexual thing. Mm -hmm. It can be an adult entertainment thing. But the moment children become involved, it's not just that you're sharing your husband, but now you're sharing your children and your offspring. And they're not only referring to you as mom, but they're referring to another woman, which is, you know, way crazier to me. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I get like sharing your husband is 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 the little wow, wow, what was going on here? But mm-hmm. the idea that you'd be willing to have your kids call another woman mom and genuinely see her as like another mom is is wild to me. And so with that being said, you're introducing the idea that we're going to not only share our husband, we're going to share our kids and we're going to share our life experiences. And this is something that I'm introducing to you. And you're not dragging me into this relationship, kicking and screaming, which always begs the question to me. That when you hear about things like this, and even in like alternative lifestyles and people who who may be participating in because you hear a lot of this. I used to watch documentaries on like all kinds of stuff. And one of the things that I watch documentaries on is like swinging. 
And that was one of the things that they would always say. It's up to the women. The women guide it. They decide who does what, when, and where. And we just basically go along. And they had pretty much, they sang the same song, mm. in the same tenor. And the weird thing about it is I've always taken a position that, yeah, maybe the ladies are doing this because that's the way you kind of steered them and directed them. Mm. And you told them how wonderful it was going to be. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, if they ever took a step back and looked at it, yeah. are they really benefiting from this experience? Yes, it's very much a, a Garrick Merrifield kind of situation with mm-hmm. Danielle and Seeking Sister Wise too. It, it's this kind of mind control where they have this ability to kind of swoon, and, and Cody definitely has that, you know, ability to sway women and he can talk around things until you mix your head spin and you don't even know what's what's going on. But that idea of, boy, wouldn't it be lovely if you had a sister wife who you could share this with? If you had a best friend that was around, if you had someone to help and you don't have to worry about babysitters, wouldn't that be great if you, you know, like, so I, I can right. see that, James. I can see how it would be like, I'm going to turn this so that when she mentions it in passing, I can now say, oh, well, I wasn't really thinking that we were going to do it. But since you mentioned it, let's discuss right. that. You know, what would that right. look like? I'm not sure if I'm into it. But, you know, since you brought it up, I mean, I can really see how the conversation can be manipulated so that the women really believe that it was their idea originally because they been told it was their idea. And they were the first one to kind of come out and say, do you ever think we would do something like that or throw some Mm. innocuous comment like that out? And then the guy can swoop in and say, "Mm, well, yeah, I I can definitely see that happen. And another thing uh, on, on the notion of the kids, that is something that struck me in this chapter too, that I was thinking about they, you know, they mention how they have to be so secretive because they're in this very unusual faith and all that. And I, I just really believe in America now. We're pretty open. I mean, and I live in the Midwest. I feel like we're pretty open to just about everything. There's all different faiths. I never see anyone make fun of Muslims or Hindu or Church of Latter Day Saints or Jehovah Witnesses. Like they're they're all around everywhere. It just is the way it is. And and this mm. really isn't a different faith. It is just LDS and they are living in an LDS community. They're just adding this extra tenant to it. However, what they are doing to their children by making them scared to speak out, afraid to say who mom and dad is, to um, not be able to say who their siblings are, the fear factor that comes along with it is... It, is v- that that's what bothered me about it and it really st- struck me more like when i was reading this chapter for some reason it was really coming up and mary talking about like oh, it was good for me because i was the first you know everybody right. else they had a problem and we heard this from the brown kids over the years too about like you know how scary it was i mean my goodness we saw the episodes how the parents were freaking out i remember that was so disturbing to me too because i thought why if you're in a situation like that and you have kids It is your responsibility to be the calm one in it. This is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. We're going to now get in the truck. We're going to go here. But instead, they were all freaked out. Cody leading the bunch with his freakiness. And then the wives all following like, oh, is there someone coming? Was there somebody here? Can you imagine what those kids were feeling there? A lot of them just stared, you know, like you didn't see a whole lot of reaction. But you know that it's just they didn't have the verb. They couldn't vocalize what the turmoil and the angst and the anxiety and the fear and everything that must have been inside them. And to live that mm. way for years, it ju- that bothers me more than anything. The, the women, they're adults. Right. Okay, I don't agree. <laughs> I don't agree, right. but that's you fine. I don't have to. Yeah. But the kids didn't have a choice in this. And to put them in an environment where they're fearful all the time and they have to lie all the time, I think is not fair to them. Right. Well, because I think that that, that kind of touches on some things. Because one, uh, to your first point about uh, the kids, you being a common uh, common force in that relationship. Uh, for, pe- for people, when you have young kids, <laughs> anytime your kid does something crazy, they jump off the couch or whatever, and they hit the ground, pow, and they hit it really hard, 
and they will look at you yeah. to see your reaction because they don't even know if you, they should be hurt or not. Like, mm-hmm. they, I'm feeling something, and they look at you for your reaction. And mm-hmm. if you as the parent start flipping out, they start flipping out too because they, oh my goodness, I must really be hurt because look, mom is crying. Yeah. You know, so I think that that is a that's a very powerful thing for you as the parent to come come and calm things down. Like one mm-hmm. of the benefits of like mom is most people uh, look back. Like I look at my mom, like no matter how bad things were, she was always the calm one. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? You break your arm or something. Okay, calm down. You're fine. Mm-hmm. We'll put you in the car. We'll get you to the emergency room. She might cry in the emergency room when I'm in back talking to the doctor, but she's very calm. Yeah. You know, and, oh, you got hurt. Let's go. So that's a very powerful thing. Now, when you talk about like the, uh, the alternative in the, the relationships, I think that part of the problem is, is that in the area where they live, they're more familiar with polygamy mm-hmm. and the abuses that occurred in these relationships historically. Mm-hmm. So when you put it in historical context, mm-hmm. like we as people who aren't familiar with these relationships, like, wow, that's kind of quirky. You just have people, everybody gets to decide what they want to do. And everything is fine as long as people know what they're doing. But when they look at it, they look at it from the historical context of a lot of the abuses that were happening with child brides and all Mm -hmm. that kind of thing that were going on. Mm -hmm. And that actually ties into the whole concept of, uh, in my house, we don't have secrets. This is the place of no secrets. Like when my kids, you don't have secrets with children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because when you foster those types of environment, it creates uh, a place where people can, can take advantage of your children. Because one of the key things that somebody who is going to try to take advantage of your child wants to do is the first thing and most important thing is they have to know that this child can keep a secret. Mm. They have to know that they can keep a secret because if they go and tell everybody, it doesn't matter what you do to them because you're going to jail. Yeah. So they have to know that you can keep a secret and they foster that secret and they foster that, that environment where you don't go back and tell people things. So I never mm. liked the idea of that. And when you talk about like these types of relationships, it's it's hand in hand with a lot of the misgivings of these cult type uh, polygamy polygamous families, where they would have things like they marry. And I think uh, there's there's one family they married in cousins, you know, mm-hmm. and and so you don't. That's the kind of stuff you don't want to tell people. Yeah. Where you at 14, 15 years old, you're promised to a guy who's in his sixties and seventies. Mm. Yeah, you don't tell people about that because Mm -hmm. DHS will be out there gathering all the kids up. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in those environments, they do have to keep secrets. So I've always had that issue. But going back to like the uh, the whole idea of your idea, this being your idea, uh, Lisa Lowe, let me get Lisa Lou with the five dollars super chat. Uh, We appreciate you, James. Nice to meet you, Jenny. Nice to meet you, Lisa Lou. (laughs) (laughs) See you, famous Jenny. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> thank you lisa i appreciate you um going back to like the whole idea of like uh, there was a movie out called suicide kings and the guy tricked the guy into doing some some shady stuff he basically two guys gangsters that tricked this one innocent kid into doing something and what was explained was when he was tricked the uh gangster that he was dealing with told him like these two guys got to talking to you and they made you think by the time everything was done, then not only were you okay with this thing that you guys were about to do, this plan you were concocting, but mm-hmm. they made you feel like it was your idea. Mm. And when I see a lot of the sister wife stuff, and especially with them saying that the women are producing and introducing this type of relationship, it's a bad idea that I think that they've been convinced was actually their idea. Mm. And that does a couple things. One, it takes responsibility off of me and puts it on you. Mm -hmm. You brought it up. You brought it to me. And when things go horribly wrong, and sometimes they do, when you come to me and you want to complain about how I'm not this and I'm not doing that and everything is going wrong, I get to look you in the face and say, I didn't present this. You presented this. Yeah. You you did this. I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Why are you yelling at me? This is your your idea. Mm -hmm. I was happy with the two of us being together, Mm -hmm. united in one family. Mm-hmm. But you want to start adding weirdos, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and Cody said that, didn't he? They all begged to be in my relationship. They were like, right. pick me, pick me, pick me. That whole horrible right. scene that he did there, trying right. to 
over exaggerate that like I was all of that. They just couldn't stop that. Yeah. Yeah. He's just, he's perpetuating that notion of, you know, this family isn't because I put it all together. They were just begging to right. They begged to come into the family. Oh yeah. And even with that, like you have the uh, protection of they're begging to come into the family. They want to be here. It's on them. It's not on me. Mm -hmm. And I get to look at you and just bask in the glory of you. When you present it, I present it to you. And then we get to talking about it. Then you present it. What do you think about polygamy? Mm -hmm. And then it's, if it's what I want, and every everybody knows this. People do this all the time. Yeah. If it's what I want, then I don't say anything. I mm -hmm. just let you talk your way into it. Mm -hmm. But if clearly, if Cody had disagreed, if she, if Mary would have came in and said, you know, let's try polygamy, I'm going to go out and get additional husbands. I bet you money he would have came out and said, that's ridiculous. It's the most disgusting thing ever. When you talk about bringing other men into the house, this and he would have had a lot to say. Oh yeah. But if you're getting what you want, you just don't say anything. You mm -hmm. just don't resist it. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. And so again, it makes it feel makes you feel like it's your idea. Mm -hmm. You're kind of talking your way into it. And I'm just not arguing with you. Or if I give you an argument, it's like, yeah, but like, who's going, well, you guys going to share a bathroom? Like stupid, like, <laughs> who cares, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think, like reading through this again, I just felt like Mary was really on the fence at the beginning about mm -hmm. whether she was going to live a polygamous family or not. You know, she had a job outside of, you know, she finally, as as a older teen, got a job at the mall had friends that were not part of the AUB, saw this other part of life and liked those friends too, and actually didn't have a whole lot of friends, if any. I don't even know if she said she had any at the beginning. In the whole AUB faith, when she had been there for years in that church, she was just a wallflower. She just didn't, she couldn't find her own. She wanted friends. She couldn't figure out how to make them. She called herself just shy. And, but yet when she was out in the world, <laughs> And, you know, taking pictures at the mall for, you know, it was probably was that picture this or picture. Was that what it was called back in the day that was in all the malls? Right. Anyway, um, she was probably one of those photographers. She started thinking, hmm, I don't know. I don't know now what I really want to do. And then enter Cody into her life, who is on the flip side of that. He was always LDS. And now he's kind of like, oh, I don't know. I might want to do this AUB polygamy thing. Um, and I think he did all along. He even admitted in this book, he was 14 years old when he first heard about it and thought, ooh. And I'm like, of course, he was 14. <laughs> right, <laughs> I can right, have more right. than one woman at a time. Like, uh, that's all that's in his mind right now that, you know, and I'm like, 14, of course. You tell any boy right. that that's a possibility. He's going to be like, all right. <laughs> I'm not going to think okay through. Yeah, the brain's not developed enough to realize the ramifications, how hard it is right. to have one wife, no less have <laughs> multiple wives. There's a lot involved in that. So he, um, I, he came into it kind of thinking, well, this is great. And my mom is doing it now too. And my, so by mm. all means, I, I, I think I'm going to go there. And so I, and because he's so manipulative and as she admits herself, she didn't speak up. She was shy. She was a wallflower. All Cody had to say was, I think your faith, Mary, is amazing. I just think it's great. I can just see how the whole conversation would go. I think it's amazing. Um, the tenets of your faith. I see the beauty in it. I see the benefits of it. I see how great my mom is with her sister wife. I just on and on and on and on that Mary would be like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. And then boom, she switches back from, I don't know if I'm going to do this to this is what we want to do. Yeah. He right, completely right. manipulated her. Right. And it, that's actually uh, one of the things that I had highlighted uh, uh, going to like a uh, piece one. I don't know if you have something a little bit before this, but uh, just on a point to it made of, uh, I highlight on a uh, piece 21, I call it a hidden gem. Uh, where I talk about, was it, uh, two? Okay, here we go. Um, okay, uh, where, where Mary has, has recites, and she says, at first when people noticed us having our, uh, hanging out together, they would ask Cody if I was his sister. Mm -hmm. I, I had been a member of this church since I was five years old. Mm -hmm. uh, this time she's about 19. 
<laughs> he was, he had been there for 13 years. Mm-hmm. And they're asking Cody, the new guy, if this is his sister. Yeah. Right. Uh, it says, but I was uh, so quiet and shy that mm-hmm. many people had simply not noticed me. Yeah. Now that I was spending time with Cody, people began to take notice. And that really struck me because there's a point where uh, in the first instance, you look at it and you say, um, you know, is that one of the attraction points for Mary to Cody? Like that, because I had never really considered that before. Mm-hmm. That if you're a quiet person, you're reserved, you're to the point where people don't even see you, they overlook you. And then you're with this person. And because you're with this person, it's not necessarily, and I'm not diminishing their love or their affection for one another, but it's, mm-hmm. it's part of, in tandem to a lot of that feeling and emotion, mm-hmm. there is a companion issue where you're with this person and you like who you are when you're with this person. When I stand next to this person, people notice me. Mm-hmm. People treat me a certain way. People mm-hmm. regard me and they they call on me. And when I'm participating in the activities, I'm free to be who I am. And people like me mm-hmm. when I'm with this person. And I like who I am when I'm with this person. So mm-hmm. us together enhances me. And yeah. so I like that situation. And that's one of the things that really struck me about this. And that's why I call it the hidden, <laughs> hidden mm-hmm. gem portion of the uh, chapter. Because from Mary's perspective, she had talked about, like, if you're a part of any organization for 13 years and the guy who showed up weeks ago, they're asking him, hey, did you bring that person? What? And you know, it's not it's not that big a group. I mean, it's not like we're talking about some massive church and they're going to an LDS temple or something like that. And so she kind of just, even then, if you go for that many years on a regular basis, people are going to recognize your face at least. I mean, like she's implying they they didn't even recognize her face, but she's been attending this and going for this amount of time and calls herself a wallflower who was just extremely shy. I'm like, that is painfully shy. If you can make yourself completely be unnoticed by anybody until he came wrong. So you're right. I mean, I think it just at that age to be at that age in your late teens Mm -hmm. And always feel like you're never seen and never heard by anybody. And, you know, she had all those brothers and sisters. Now, she was the um, first, right? Well, Cody was the first. She was the first, too, wasn't she? She was the first. So she had all these younger siblings. So they probably took up a lot of time, too. So she probably didn't get a lot of attention that way either. So now, finally, it's like this light and shine, you know, this knight in shining armor appears appears attracted to her. And she said, nobody had ever noticed all the other girls are the ones that got all the guys. No guy ever paid attention to me, never had a boyfriend, never had anyone interested in her. And then, you know, this charismatic man who everybody is just drawn to comes and he's interested in her. It's kind of like one of those love stories, you know, it's, it's the notebook here. (laughs) that she's living so of course and that's why i say if he even implied i'm interested in you but i'm also interested in your faith she would have been like yeah yeah okay you know Mm -hmm. absolutely that's actually that's actually a good point too because uh something that kind of and this is again one of the things that really gets overlooked that overlooked during the course of the show because during the show they do talk about Mary's one of Mary's siblings, uh, her sister who passed away. Right. Uh, she she became ill. She passed away, and then her, she was also a polygamist. And her sister wife took on her kids, and she she was, talks about her heavily. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until I read the book, actually, <laughs> recently, when mm-hmm. I read this chapter, and I saw that she was one of twenty seven children. She had twenty seven siblings, brothers and sisters. So it's not hard to imagine that in that type of family environment that you would get overlooked, that mm-hmm. you would be passed by. And she said her father was very good about, you know, claiming all the children. Mm-hmm. But the question is always, how much time is he actually spending with mm-hmm. his children? Especially mm-hmm. when you look at like, uh, even reflective of later on in season 17, I want to say, 
when mm-hmm. Cody was talking about like uh, I think it was season 16 actually when Cody they were having a meeting and they were talking about the kids going back to school for COVID and he was saying well you know I feel like the older kids don't really need their father around mm-hmm. and this is that point where I would point to it and say this is a place where kids need their father around. This is when they need their parents around. They need that input because you give them like as a parent pays attention to their children, you give them a level of confidence Mm -hmm. because you give them a safety in allowing them to discover who they are. Mm -hmm. And so when she talks about Cody provided that thing to her where he created a safe environment where she could come out of her shell and reveal who she is to me. And at least in my experience, my personal upbringing, and even the way I try to do my, with my kids, that's the role of a parent. Mm-hmm. A parent can give you that experience where you feel safe and secure. Like a lot of, I was allowed to do, I did a lot of stuff when I was a young man and, uh, and I was very outgoing and I'm an extrovert uh, by nature. And a lot of that, I'm the, uh, I give a lot of that credit for that uh, experience, or at least that side of my personality to my parents, mm-hmm. because they made it safe for me to try stuff and do extra things and, and put myself out there. And if I succeed, I succeed. If I fail, I fail. But who cares? Because it's what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And I felt that security because of my parents. And if she's one of 27, and she didn't necessarily feel that reinforcement from her father, I don't know if this is true. And I just mm-hmm. kind of putting it out there. There's mm-hmm. a possibility. And she didn't feel that reinforcement from her father or from her, her parents. Then maybe this is why she would be drawn into this type of relationship with a guy who gives her the attention that she didn't necessarily get at home. And all of a sudden he, she's getting this new attention and it's the most amazing feeling. Again, this mm-hmm. begs the question, is this love or is this just how he made you feel because you never felt this thing before? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I, I think she never got over that either. Like, I think she right. fell hard. It was her first love. It was her only love. It was all that attention that she received. I think she would have been a great monogamous. I mean, the two of them would have been great in a monogamous relationship, really. They, cause right. they seemed really in love with each other at the very beginning. Um, Although, you know, I mean, we just kind of throw it here. I actually, I highlighted in green the things that Cody said about Mary in this chapter. Let me just read to you what he said about Mary. He said, Mary was so cute and sweet when I met her that I had a hard time suppressing my hopelessly romantic nature. She had a remarkably remarkable purity about her. I had a sneaking suspicion that we were soulmates. He goes on to say, it was no longer possible for me to deny that I had strong feelings for Mary. She was sweet and innocent and a wonderful listener. She validated my existence and we became inseparable. I had planned to stay with my parents for a few days, so Mary drove back to Utah with some of our friends. This was the first time in weeks we had been separated for so long. I thought about her constantly while we were apart. After the baptism, when he baptized into the AUB faith, after the baptism, I knew that I wanted to marry her, referring to Mary. Um, I had a feeling that she would say yes if I asked, but as usual, I was moving too quickly and following my romantic impulses. We hadn't even started courting. I was already kneeling at the altar. And then he goes on to say, I loved Mary, um, and I was certain of it. Um, then there's a paragraph about his past infatuations and how, um, he kissed all these girls, ironic because of the whole, you can't kiss anybody because of the, um, pheromones or whatever it was, the hormones that were going back and forth, but apparently he kissed them all. Um, and he had a real difficult time not kissing her, but he did anyway, before they were married. Um, he said this was no simple infatuation. It was love. And it was love that had been established with uh, without the complications of physicality, which made it um, spiritual above all else. Later on, he goes on to say, Mary looked fabulous in this pink dress that she wore, which accentuated her curves in a way that I had not noticed before our engagement. I didn't need any proof that I was attracted to her at this point. 
I knew it without a doubt, and I was very excited about my decision to marry her. It seemed throughout the dance, I found this interesting because later on, this is kind of what Robin describes at a dance about Cody, and this is what he's right. saying about Mary. It seemed throughout the dance that we were the only people there. The voices and chatter of our friends and family seemed to be just a background hum as we got lost in each other. She was the most beautiful girl in the whole room. I couldn't take my eyes off of her the whole night. Our chemistry was undeniable. It goes on. Our friendship developed into a remarkable love affair. We shared everything with each other. Mary was my fiance. We were very much in love. Our relationship was a typical love story, the kind that you see in movies and TV. And this is Cody's words. This is what confused me so much. We must have aggravated our friends and family with how much in love we were while we were outwardly infatuated with each other. Deep down, we were becoming soulmates. I suspect that we were soulmates from the moment we met. I mean, those are strong words. Right. Strong words that he's throwing out, writing this after he married Robin. So, like, I just right. find it really hard to believe that he wasn't in love with her at the mm -hmm. beginning. And I think that that, that, that connection was there in, until eventually he had a stronger one with somebody else. Right. Right. But, well, and that's kind of the, the weird part about it too, is that I think that when you're, when you're kind of flying by the seat of your pants, which is how they pretty much describe a lot of the experiences with mm -hmm. him, how he conducts himself, mm -hmm. that, a lot of that uh, that emotional dynamic where you're kind of all over the place and you're bouncing and you just kind of go by the seat of your pants mm -hmm. and what you feel at the moment because it's the, I'm living in the moment, it's for now, YOLO, you only live once. Yeah. That whole mentality, it puts you in a position where it, it forces you down a certain line up until the point where you get distracted and you go a different way. Mm -hmm. And a lot, and a lot of times you're you're super hard into it. Oh, it's amazing! I'm I'm completely committed to this. I'm addicted, and then all of a sudden you go left without any warning. Yeah. And, that, and that could be a thing where where Cody is uh he he thought he was all in it, and he thought this is where he should be, and then he meets something else, he gets distracted, and boom, he's on to the next one. Mm -hmm. And then you're all into that relationship, Janelle, and. And it creates problem between Janelle and Mary because the two of them aren't getting along because Mary is feeling neglected because she's not secure in her relationship. And then boom, he's on to the next one. Mm -hmm. And he has to find something to calm that down in the form of Christine. Then when he gets with Robin, it's a whole, like, so he kind of does the whole spirited thing. And I think that like even the idea of uh, <laughs> the kissing thing where, you know, the, the uh, chemicals go in your brain and yeah. all of a sudden it affects your mind and that stuff he said, uh, McKelty, which was ironically, uh, reiterated by Garrick later on. By yes. Uh, about oh, although he twisted it in a way yeah, that yeah. it was like beyond. <laughs> he took it to places he should never go. Like, what he should not have about? gone. He should not have gone. He's some kind of maniac. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but uh, I think that's him saying, like, that was more projection and profession mm -hmm. and confession than it was actual him talking to them about their situation. This is how I live my life when I was single. So you must be doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that you're kissing somebody and you, you exchanging biological zygotes or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think that that became a problem. One of the things that he mentioned actually about the things that he liked about Mary that really rung my bell. I just kind of let right off the page was where he had said that uh, she was a wonderful listener. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I said, and one of the things that uh, kind of sparks when I hear that, is usually people say that you're a wonderful listener when you like to talk. <laughs> I mean, you, <laughs> so true. <laughs> you know, when you talk a lot, you're like, oh, they're such good listeners. It's not that they're good listeners, just that you talk the whole time and they didn't interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely true, James. You're, you're spot on there. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that that was also part of the, uh, and, and again, I think that the, like, like I'll, I'll preface it this way. With Robin, I think that there is a point where he's attracted to Robin because Robin allows him to be the type of man that he imagines how men should be. Mm. He gets to be the provider, the protector. He gets to take care of her. 
he gets to be the hero in the story. He's not looking, she's not his partner. She's somebody who relies on him for everything. Mm -hmm. And so he gets to be that thing. And then early on in the relationships, and this is, you know, this is just my theory. I, I can't prove this either way. But with Mary, I think that, that there's also a part of that too. Because as he's trying to find his way, being with somebody who is not challenging him for the spotlight, somebody who is shy, somebody who is a great listener, mm -hmm. allows him to be the person whom he wants to be. Mm -hmm. And because of that gift of her allowing him to be who he wants to be, all of a sudden, I think that that can be transposed as to him feeling like I have a true love connection with her mm. because she's allowing me to be the character and the person I want to be. I'm flying around the room and she's right there cheering me on. Mm -hmm. I crack a joke, she's laughing the loudest. Mm -hmm. I'm the funniest, most handsomest, most wonderful, dynamic person, sexiest person in the room. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate her appreciating me. Mm -hmm. And I think that that could also be part of the foundation of their relationship, at least mm -hmm. early on. Yeah, And then part of what makes the relationship fall apart is that you outgrow the need for that person to be that thing for you. Mm -hmm. And so you move past, it, you know? Yeah. Cause he got it from someone else. Then he got it from Robin. Once he got it from Robin, right. the, the OG three kept saying, if we reflect on it, everything was really good for those first 13, however many years before Robin came into the picture. It really was like, mm. and Mary says, like, were we a little dysfunctional? Yeah. Did we have things to work through? Yeah. A lot of families do. Um, but she goes, it, it's by and large, all good memories. Um, right. And Christine has recently said that too. Like, yeah, at the beginning, it, it, it was all great. They all had their places and all that. And then Robin came and just like you said, filled that need. She's now mm -hmm. the listener because Christine wasn't the listener. She was always letting him know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> he needed to do like, I mean, she tried, she tried, like, you know, she tried, she tried her best, but even with her trying the best, she would speak her mind. And I, I right. don't feel like, I think Janelle may have, but she did it in a different way. I think she was more genteel about it and she was able to intellectually get her point across. She might've been able to manipulate him a little bit too, right. but in the way she was, but Mary, yeah, she was, she was all in. And then he got that from Robin and more, and he had no need for Mary anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. Which right. is so it's, sad. It's a, it's a rough, it's a rough ordeal. Yeah, and I, and I think that like even with the idea of like we had talked to earlier about uh, convincing them that this is their idea, mm -hmm. there is a point as well when you deal with uh, <laughs> uh, wise people realize they don't know Plato. Wise wise men realize they don't know, and mm -hmm. that's the basis of like a, his form of philosophy. Yeah, uh, you realize you don't know Socratic, even Socratic thought. You realize yeah. you don't know, and that makes you a wise person. Yeah. With him and dealing with somebody of that personality, they say, well, if you come in super hot and you act like you have all the answers and you know everything and you understand exactly what's going on, mm -hmm. it's hard to combat that with a question. Because if you're genuinely honest, even though you may have a feeling that this isn't necessarily the right move for me or my family, mm -hmm. this person that you're dealing with is so sure mm -hmm. that this is the right thing to do. I'm mm -hmm. so positive that we can have these great relationships if you just agree to a platonic or not platonic. If you agree to a plural marriage or a polygamous marriage, we would have a great life and a great family mm -hmm. if we, you just agree to it. I don't know. If you don't know, I know. And that's yeah. where I think a lot of the uh, the push comes in as well, is that you know, when you see it later on, you agree to it and you're kind of going along with it and hoping everything turns out okay. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest uh, letdowns, I think, for so many people who watch the show and are fans of the show mm -hmm. and why they uh, herald Mary and OG3, Mary, Christine, and Janelle, is because they can see themselves in their position where mm -hmm. somebody new comes along and steals away the person that they've invested their time, energy, wounds, uh, Everything that you have, your youth, you poured it into this person. And then one day he meets somebody else. And then without you saying it, a flip, a switch is flipped and he decides to go a different way. And this is actually like most people's nightmares. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you're with somebody for, you know, close to two decades. And then all of a sudden they come back like, yeah, I didn't really care about you. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> the family we built. Yeah. Not really <laughs> my thing. <laughs> <laughs> I like convertible Lexuses. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's a very good point. <laughs> I'd written here also, we were talking about, you started talking about, you know, Cody also kind of shooting from the hip. One thing that in this chapter comes up a lot that Mary refers to and, and Cody as well is his impulsivity, if you will, mm -hmm. like his inability to think through things and very immature right. kind of level of of growing up which i think he had early on when he was taking all those wives too you know he was just kind of collecting them and oh yeah you want to come too okay um i don't know how many other offers he had besides these through besides the one girl who ended she ended up backing out at the end we never hear any stories about all these women who wanted to join and he was like, no, 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 no. Um, I mean, a few that just wanted to, you know, that the wives are like, he only, should, they only want to be married to Cody. So this isn't going to work. Right, right. But I had written down as I was, I had, as I was reading it, I'm like, okay, here are some examples um, of Cody's impulsivity. We have first at the beginning, he asks Mary to marry him prior to asking Mary for her father's consent in this extremely conservative AUB faith. He just got impulsive, had the ring and just went buying the ring was an impulsive thing. They were looking at rings. He hadn't, she, they hadn't even, he dropped the hint that he might propose to her like, Hey, what do you right. think will happen if maybe? And she's like, I don't know. I have to think about it. Um, and then he goes and buys a ring just because they happen to look at one has a sister when she's not looking just buy that, you know, another impulse, impulse move that he says, okay, he converted to the AUB faith and admits that that same day he was ready to propose and, and get married to her that like, he just instantly, right. as soon as he's like, Oh, I'm part of the faith now. It's like, he, he's like, and then he realized, well, shoot, I haven't even proposed to her, but yet I'm, as he put it, I'm already kneeling at the altar, like mm -hmm. all in hook, line and sinker. Um, and then later on in life, the move to Vegas really seemed like a knee jerk reaction. I don't know how much of a threat it was. I don't know how much the producers were involved in encouraging them to also go or whatnot. But um, from people who are around in the area, you know, just like Reddit threads. So, you know, take it for what it's worth. There really wasn't that eminent threat, you know, and when the police were right. going by and all that, well, you know, it's just. Um, they never stopped. They never knocked on the door and said, we're concerned about your faith. They knew they were there and they said, you know, right. keep this on the down low. So I feel like that whole move was, again, a knee jerk reaction. They didn't have a place to go. They didn't have a place to stay. When you have a family that big and you don't like plan again, um, the move to Flagstaff. Our right. family's going to pick up and move again. What, why? 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 The kids are so happy here. Why are we doing this? This was supposed to be the haven that now all of a sudden this is what the other place was. No longer any good. And not right. as accepting this next town. They're going to be accepting of us. We need to go there too. And the family really in the end didn't have a say. He said, where one goes, we all go. And right. the decision right. was made and that they couldn't sell the houses again impulsivity going to buy in the land they didn't even sell their houses they didn't even have the money to pay for it i mean it's it's crazy he hasn't grown out of this um the demand for his family to stay apart during covid and here's the funny thing also um and then i have here mary mary whoever agrees to marry him um but that whole covid thing and and all of these situations he made the decision to do it and by god he didn't back down. All of right. these went through in the end. He managed to convince everybody to jump on his bandwagon or just follow his command and the COVID being the last one. And then finally, the family ends up blowing up over his inability to have forethought and to think through decisions. He still hasn't learned. Right, right. And that's what I mean too. Like with, the, like with him getting what he wanted, a lot of that came down to just him being rock solid sure about mm -hmm. all the moves they're going to make. Let's hey, let's move to uh, Vegas. This is what we need to do. We're moving to Vegas. Mm -hmm. oh, is this a good idea? No, nope, that's why don't we move to Wyoming? Why don't we move to a different part of Utah? Why don't we move closer mm -hmm. to family or in communities where polygamy actually exists so that that mm -hmm. way we're not isolating ourselves from our community? Mm -hmm. no, no, we're going to go to Vegas and we're going to basically start our own church. 
let's move to Flagstaff. We're going to move to Flagstaff before we decided to sell the homes, before we prep the houses for sale. We don't have a nickel in the bank, but we're going to not only are we going to move to a different place and not have anything set up, but we don't have the money. We don't even know if we're getting the money that we want from the houses that we're selling. Right. Like, no, nothing set in stone. So there was a lot of impulsivity that was going on. Even when he talked about uh, during the book, he talked about uh, after they were married, they both quit their jobs and decided to go away and they were going to find new work somewhere else <laughs> when they got back. Like, so you left the, yes. you left your job. I forgot to write that on one down. Yes. Yeah. Went on the honeymoon and was like, yeah, I just worry about work when I get home. Like, yeah. who goes on vacation? The whole point of you going on vacation is so you could pretend to be rich. You are actually rich. <laughs> you got to come home and work. You got to pay them bills. Yes. You know, he was like, whatever, we won't go. It's Nothing a different time. mindset, too, to be able to go on vacation knowing you just quit your job. You have no job. Afterwards, you right. both have to find job. Both of you quit your jobs. What brain can relax and go right, on a right. trip and enjoy spend, yourself? And that's the whole thing. I would spend the entire vacation thinking about, well, where am I going to get? I got to get a job. Yes. Like, I got to get something. Like, yes. Where are we going to stay? How are we going to eat? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? But, mm -hmm. but he, but that by the seat of your uh, living, and again, this is that <laughs> to me. I think that this is a uh, very close to what you might call uh, dating crazy people. Like mm -hmm. crazy is fun, crazy is exciting, mm -hmm. but crazy is also very scary. Yeah, because when he dates somebody who who's very unpredictable, you don't know what's going on. It's a very exciting relationship because you don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. But they make horrible partners because at the end of the day, you have no stability, mm -hmm. you have no security, and you're always guessing as to what's going on. What are we doing next? Even when they moved to Flagstaff, you recall when they uh, talked about moving to Flagstaff, uh, Robin was making a position that when we move to Flagstaff, we're going to stay there forever and be buried there. And all the other OG3 were like, yeah, we'll stay there until Cody decides he don't want to be there anymore. Right. And, you know, he get the itch and all of a sudden we packing bags and we we leaving and it's not rhyme or reason. Like we're going to leave because I found this better thing and I plan this out. It's like, I just don't want to be here anymore. Let's go. Right. That's not a plan. Yeah. And like you said, one of the more horrifying things. And this is kind of, to you know, I, I don't really want to smash parenting. I mean, I'll just say this. It's a different style of parenting than my own. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't feel comfortable putting myself in a situation where I would move somewhere and not have things set up for me when I got there. I wouldn't mm -hmm. feel comfortable with me. Yeah. I certainly wouldn't feel comfortable taking children, especially my kids, mm -hmm. having my kids out there and I'm trying to figure it out. Ugh. That to me would be the most scary situation yeah. ever. Like yeah. for me to not know what I'm going to do with my kids. Right. Like even going to Vegas, we don't have a place to stay. We're going to stay in a rental for a couple of weeks. I'm sure we'll find something when we're out there. That's not mm -hmm. a plan. No. That's not a plan. Mm -mm. Like, well, the, and, and if the police, my little two on the uh, whole Utah uh, law enforcement thing, if the police are going to come and get you, you leaving the state does not stop an indictment. Preach. <laughs> if, if, they, <laughs> if they swear out a warrant, that's it. That's it. Especially yes. What yes. You don't ever do. Don't ever go somewhere fun where the police are more than well. They'll be lining up to mm -hmm. come and get you for mm -hmm. extradition. There's mm -hmm. not a cop in Utah that's not going to like, you know what? I would like to go mm -hmm. and spend the weekend in Utah on the department or spend a weekend in Vegas on the department. I'll go uh, go to the courthouse on Friday, submit the paperwork, then spend the weekend get him on Monday and come back, drive on back on Monday. Yeah. And it's all in the department. I get per diem as far as food is concerned. I get uh, some spending money mm -hmm. for entertainment that you probably can't do booze on, but you can do other stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, and you have a great old time. So never yeah. go somewhere fun. Go yeah. somewhere where the cops are like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> yeah. Who wants to go get you? Ah. <laughs> We're to come back. But if you go to like Hawaii, yeah, they, they're there. They're, they're getting, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're lining up, you know. So yeah. But that's a, to me, I think that that speaks volumes. Again, that speaks to the impulsiveness of yeah. of his nature. Yeah. And they, what they call the Cody Coaster. Yes. Like, I think uh, Robin had cracked that joke and Christina yeah. cracked that joke. 
And I think that that's pretty much what they were experiencing. And again, I can see the excitement of that mm-hmm. when you're young. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. You know, I had no responsibility. You know. Yeah, not with kids in tow. It's like Cody puts himself first. It's what Cody right. wants is what drives all his decisions. And then he considers the wise. He really considers Robin's opinion on how mm. this is going to affect everything and then figures out how he's going to let the other ones know what's going on. And the kids don't, they clearly are not a factor in his decisions because they have gone in tow. And and I just can't even imagine the number of times they had to change goals. And the fact that like he wouldn't let Mariah stay for one more year to graduate when she in tears. I mean, if my child came to me in tears, like knowing they had family and friends and people she could stay with for one year, one school year, nine months is all that she was asking. Like, let me just actually, she even wanted to just finish out that year on top of it. Not even like her senior year. She's just like, can I just finish this year? Because I'm doing this dance. I'm doing this stuff. Mm. And I just thought he, he has no emotional connection to these right. kids. He's not putting their needs first at all in this situation. It was it was disheartening. It was what Cody wanted to do. So that's what they did. Well, and that, that actually kind of ties into too, like even with uh, because uh, Mariah called, it goes by Leon now. What? With, with with that, right? I'm sorry. I apologize. That's no, my. No. I'm pi- I'm picturing her when she was. But you're right. 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 I do the same thing. Like I'll be watching the episode. Like yeah. That, uh, right. Because you keep hearing it, moment. and at right. that time, that was her name. But you're you're right. I I misspoke. It is Leon now. Right. No. It's, yeah. It's what it is. But but when but even during that time, I think that the challenge that they had, and it begs the question. Are you concerned with keeping the family together or are you concerned with the image because you're on TV? Mm. Are you concerned with making sure that, you know, they're with their mom and they're raised by the family with your values and everything and trusted because that's your responsibility? And if it is your responsibility, how seriously are you taking that responsibility? If you're moving a family, you don't really have a plan. Yeah. Or are you concerned with the television aspect. Mm. Like, I, we're going to be on TV, and I want everybody to know that I keep my family together. Where we go one, we go all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Where we do that. You know what I mean? So that mm-hmm. that actually becomes one of the challenges, too. And, and it's just a weird thing. Like, I just, like, I, I think that the, those, like, the, uh, the interactions that they had, and especially with Cody and the way he presents himself, especially early on, again, I see the, the fun side of it. Mm-hmm. But I can also see the the immensely destructive side of it. This is like like the, one of the comparisons he uses is uh we're not going to be like the alcoholic family where we sweep the problems under the rug. This is also a trait of people who have uh, substance abuses, mm-hmm. substance abuse issues. Is that they they are very unstable in a lot of their decision making. When they're fun, they're up, they're up. Mm-hmm. But when they're down, they're down. Mm-hmm. And when they're up. They're a lot of fun to be around. A lot of times they can be the most funniest person at the party mm-hmm. or at the family gathering. They're hilarious. You know what I mean? But when they're down and they're down and out, it's it's a rough ride. And I think that that's one of the dynamics that even though it's present, it's never really talked about or accentuated in a lot of the discussions, yeah. you know, with regard to that, which, yeah. I, which I always think is interesting. There's also one part in it where, uh, it was on uh, 21, where... Cody, t- Cody basically friend zone Mary, and I said, "Wow, this is crazy." This uh, is a at that precise moment, I expected him to make this is Mary uh, talk about Cody, mm-hmm. <laughs> and they're courting pre courting. Uh, I expected him to make some sort of uh, declaration to me, or at least hint at his feelings towards me. He mm-hmm. said, "I can't get involved in any relationship with girls right now." Like our friendship, let's continue that. <laughs> you friend zone. It's, like you've been hanging out with her tough and hanging out with her tight this whole time. Then all of a sudden, yeah. like, yeah, I think we're just going to be friends. And then and, like and a week later, he invites her up to Wyoming for Thanksgiving. I'm like, 
what? Talk right. about mixed messages that you're giving this poor girl, like implying that he's all into her, and then all of a sudden he friend zones her, and then he invites her to go stay <laughs> at his parents' house. I right. mean, I don't know. It didn't say how many other people he might have invited to that thing, so maybe there was a whole group, but nevertheless, it just, he's all over the place. You're right. He's all over right. the place. And there is a, there, even with that, there's a sense of, uh, and I, I don't want to play it up too much, but it's, uh, for lack of a better phrase, to turn a better phrase, I think that there's a sense of cruelty involved with that. Mm -hmm. Because if you know that somebody is really into you and you invite them up to a family event, yes, you know, knowing full well that you're going to, you're friend zoning them mm -hmm. and you're inviting them to things or activities that you would invite a boyfriend or girlfriend. Yeah, you know it is hurt. That would hurt more than anything else. There's a, a cruel nature, and even as you said later on, you fully expect her to be available when you're ready to mm -hmm. move it into beyond friends. You expect her to jump right on it yeah. and be right there with you because this is what you want, and it makes you feel better. Yeah. So, and sadly, uh, that's what happened. So it just fed mm. his his belief of, yeah, this is how I should operate. And these women will cater to me on my schedule right. and on my timeline. Yeah. Yeah, it reinforces that bad habit. Yeah. Uh, Kim Gilbertson, what's going on? Five dollar super chat. Uh, it was fun when they were all just crazy, but now, yeah. now they're just destructive. It's downright, it's not downright dangerous, if not yeah. downright dangerous. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's that's one of the craziest parts about the uh the show. And that's one of the struggles that I think I, I was having. Thank you so much, Cam Gilbertson. Mm -hmm. Uh I think that was one of the struggles I was having early on when I was after what happened with uh with uh Garrison that you know, because how much was going on and how much of this is actually helping, you know. But I think that like there's no you know, even as I talked about it before, there's no power in secrecy. There's no power in darkness. So mm -hmm. that's kind of where I turned the corner in deciding to come back to uh, Sister Wives. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't really help if we just kind of ignore it and pretend mm -hmm. like it doesn't exist or it doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, oh, But I respect uh, those people who don't. I know there's a whole bunch of people right. out there who are not watching the show anymore, but they're watching our channels. <laughs> Right, right. I've no, heard a lot of people like I'm just going to watch reviews from here on out because I don't want to have my my watching counted for TLC. Right. But on the same <laughs> same notion, I do want to know what's going on. So I'm still watching all the content creators. Right, <laughs> right. Funny. And, and that's and that's kind of where I'm at. I'm, I'm I'm more or less in the camp of I'm hoping that the uh, the content that's provided provide isn't just necessarily a recap of the show but actually provide something maybe some insight to yeah. or some perspective that people hadn't considered and yeah. something that they could use in their day to day yeah you know so absolutely yeah. <laughs> but uh did, did you have something else that you wanted to point out because i had just one more thing i think um let's see here we talked about all this No, everything else goes along. Actually, we, the honeymoon, typical Cody Brown style trip, everything was spontaneous and unplanned. Again, just goes with his impulsivity. Another thing that I didn't right. write down, but I did highlight it when I was reading it that like, yeah, that started from day one. Um, yeah, that's all I have highlighted. Okay. But well, well there's uh, two points that actually I wanted to touch on. Uh, okay. The first was where... Uh, to, just to continue or complete the thought. And then I wanted to pull it back to talk about like uh, something that I noticed about the interaction with Cody and Mary that actually really hit me with uh, regard to Robin. Um, but the first part was actually something that uh, Cody's mom had said to him as far as, uh, as you mentioned, his impulsivity. Uh, where did I have that? At? Uh, two, 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 two. Okay. Uh, <laughs> What his mom had said to him with regard to uh, making sure he takes his time in getting involved in these relationships and recommending that he doesn't just jump into another relationship after another relationship and waiting to find uh, the proper time to start these types of uh, engage in these relationships so he can move towards marriage. Um, yes. Oh, no, that, about, I was just going to say that's a good part. And that same thing. Um, he talks about how he would find himself 
He was so impulsive with all relationships. Any girl who was interested in him, he would date and um, be a part of and to the point that multiple times, I can't remember the exact word, but basically he said more than once he would find himself holding hands with somebody he didn't even like. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and that, that actually, that, well, because that that's a good point. Because, um, yeah, well, let me do that first. The, with him saying that somebody he doesn't like, there's always a point where are you doing this thing because this is what you should do? Mm-hmm. It is what you want to do? Or are you doing this thing because it's something you feel you should be doing? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. it, it's what would what would a guy in my position be doing right now? Holding this girl's hand. She's attractive. She seems to be into me. I should be holding her hand. Mm-hmm. And he holds her hand. Are you holding her hand because you want to? Or are you holding her hand because this is something you should be doing? Mm-hmm. So that's that's kind of the first thing. The second thing is I always thought it, I thought it was interesting. And again, this is one of the things that kind of leaked off the page where he said, my mother told me that I that I should take time away from girls or at least from dating them. She knew that I needed to become less careless and discover what it was I truly wanted from a relationship whom I and whom I truly loved. Now, when, when I hear that, that's actually reminiscent of something that Dan said later when he was talking about the time that he took in dating Robin versus the time he took in dating uh, Christine. I think it was when he was talking to Christine's oldest daughter, or older daughter, McKelty, okay. about her dating habits uh-huh. and saying that they need to take more time to get to know one another. And it just makes the relationship better. And Christine got bent out of shape because she's like, we, you know, we dated kind of fast and we got married almost right away. And so did the other women, but he took his time with Robin and for him to express that he had a better relationship with Robin because he took that time. It actually recalled to me what, what his mother had said to him, take your time, make sure that this person is who you want to be with and figure out if this is the relationship you want to be a part of. And later in season 17, I want to say he had talked, I think it was 18. He talked about how he had rushed into these marriages and these marriages were always doomed to fail because he didn't take his time to get to know them. Mm-hmm. So had he listened to his mom, mama's always right, guys. If mm-hmm. had he listened to his mom, <laughs> he would he would have realized that she was actually onto something, and that might have prevented a lot of his problems. Maybe he wouldn't have got involved with polygamy. And I think because I think earnestly, he could have been happy with any one of the OG three wives if mm-hmm. he would have focused on them. Yeah. You know, but he did. He was so busy trying. I think, it, like you said, he was collecting wives that maybe it just didn't come to fruition. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, that's a very good yeah. point. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I have Maureen here. I don't. I don't think I can pull it up on your screen. Can you see Maureen's? Um. um oh yes, yes, yes. Super chat. Maureen. It's hard. 99 Super Chat. Thank you so much, Maureen. I know. Amazing, Maureen. <laughs> I've enjoyed your discussion tonight. Please do it again. It's up to, you know, I'm more than willing to do it. I had a good time. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Jenny says she's in the, in the game. In the, mix. In the game. Yeah. <laughs> this is a blast. I've been looking forward to this all week. All right. Amazing. Thing. Again, thank you for coming out. Oh, the last thing I wanted to point out, because as promised, I like to give a little teaser. Then I like to deliver. Don't never make a promise that you don't plan on uh, fulfilling. But thank you again, Maureen. I appreciate you. Um, there was one point where Mary had talked about an uh it's on my page 18, uh, under Mary, where it says, uh, I first noticed Cody, and this is her first interaction with Cody when she first notices him. Mm-hmm. She said, I first noticed Cody at church. Our church group is quite close-knit and has been together for a long time. So any new face really stands out. Hmm. Hmm. I'll read hmm. that one more again. Any new <laughs> face really stands out. So I, I thought about that with regard to uh, Robin coming up to the church. They said they didn't notice Robin until she showed up to the party, and that's when they first noticed her. But as even as Mary had stated, the, the church groups are so small and they're so close-knit that when a stranger shows up, mm-hmm. that stranger sticks out you know, like a sore thumb, like, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. naked man with his hair on fire, but they stick out. <laughs> and so if you have a diesel gene model, mm-hmm. <laughs> you still up to church. You can't tell me that the guy, especially the guys aren't recognized. Yo, I'll say the guys, you can't tell me that the guys don't notice 
an attractive woman coming into the into the service. Right. But at the same time, folks, let's be honest. Ladies, you guys know this too. <laughs> you probably <laughs> noticed before the guys did. Right. Who is Look this girl? Her. She doesn't belong here. Get her out of here. <laughs> Look at this talk coming in here. With... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ladies can be brutal. Yeah, y'all can be brutal about it with each other. So I, I think that that's kind of an interesting point. Because again, they always stress, and I, I've re reached the point where they talk about Cody meeting Robin, but I'm just familiar from the show's perspective mm -hmm. of how they talked about it, that mm -hmm. it was a surprise and they didn't know who she was. Robin has said, at least to my understanding, that she came up and she went to a service with her cousin mm -hmm. at her cousin's church. Mm -hmm. And then they went to a party and that's where she met Cody and Rob, uh, Mary, and they were mm -hmm. dancing all night. Well, there was one time. more one more meeting in between there. There was... Um the the surprising circumstance wouldn't you know it that cody and mary were just going for a drive one day and just happened to pass this friend's house who is the cousin of robin and robin happened mm. to be standing outside on the front lawn with a whole bunch of people they were all just hanging out on the front lawn and she was at the time putting her kids into the car she was getting ready to go so I mean, do we really think that Cody didn't know that Robin was in town and that she was at at this person's house at that time? It's all coincidence, according to them, right. that they just happened to drive by. So then there was that interaction between them. And then the dance was a few weeks after that. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. All, yeah that's... all coincidences, according to the two of them. Super sketchy. And, Super. and I'm always thinking. I've always taken a position. Again, I can't prove this is just my personal theory, my personal feel. I've always kind of taken a position, or at least had the ideation that Cody and Robin knew each other mm -hmm. prior to them actually. The first time that Mary may have had the conversation with Robin may have very well been at the party. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time she had an opportunity to interact with her. Mm -hmm. But I've always kind of taken a position that Cody knew who Robin was, that they had actually talked and they had a relationship. Because like, even with what you're saying, like I didn't know about them pulling up at the house when she just happens to be coming out mm -hmm. and you just happen to be driving down somebody's block and, hey, this, who's that sexy thing getting yep. in the car? Like, that's insane to me. Stalkers mm -hmm. just all get out. Mm -hmm. In the 80s and 90s, that would be romantic. Now it's just creepy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. It's redefined now. <laughs> right, right, right. Now you got you might have some paperwork waiting for you when you get back out. Again, the police will be waiting for you. <laughs> but that, like I think that that's a different circumstance. Like I, I, I it, it just kind of strikes me as weird that she's always in the right places. Oh They're yeah. They're about to get the TV show. They're about to mm -hmm. move into a different position. Mm -hmm. Had Cody been in a position like he was when he first met Mary, which is also a huge point for me too. When I talk about like uh, builders versus fenders. Like somebody who you start a relationship with and they're a builder. Like there's somebody that, you know, you guys start, you know, you have nothing, you flat broke, busted, and you guys build your your lives together. You build your empire with this partner versus somebody who, you know, you build it with this partner. You leave that partner and go to the nightmare scenario where you pick up a girlfriend or a mistress and you share all the things that you became thanks to that person who you built with. Mm -hmm. And you share all your spoils of, of life with this new person whom you never would have been able to get had it not been for your the time you spent with that first wife or that first partner mm -hmm. in building what you have. Mm -hmm. You know, so if, Co if Cody would have went to her, like, I don't know. And this is just my supposition again. But there's a possibility that if Cody would have went to Robin and he was in the position he was in when he first met Mary and he was working a dead end job and they, a job that's so frivolous that he could walk off of it and not think twice about it to go on honeymoon. Mm -hmm. and he met Robin at that point. Robin very well may never have talked to him mm -hmm. but because he had a TV show coming out. He seemed like he was a little successful. He had big things on the horizon. Mm -hmm. You know, she yeah. had three kids that she needed to take care of. All of a sudden, Cody becomes an option. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm there with you, James. The whole thing is sketch right from the beginning. Right. It really is. Right. And you go back. I actually did a video on this too. When at the point in the book 
when she mentions that she first saw Cody, um, she went with her cousin. You know, she visited her cousin four hours away. <laughs> okay, mm. whatever. She drives four hours just to visit the cousin for the weekend and happens to go to church with her before she drives the four hours back, which just so happens to be the Brown family's church at the time in Lehigh, Utah. And so there's she's sitting down and Cody was sitting in front of her. So she sees them. She kind of gets all fluttered and excited and all that. Oh, but I, but but I thought nothing of it. Okay, but then goes on to say that she got a chance to um, um, try to lock eyes or look at him again. I can't remember how it was worded, but the point was she said during the service she had to go to the bathroom, so she got up and walked past him and looked at him. Well, I'm like, you just said he's sitting in front of you. <laughs> Right. So in order to pass him, you're going up to the altar <laughs> to right, go to the right. bathroom. <laughs> like the story just doesn't jive. Did you? Did anyone proofread this? Because this is this is there's a lie in here somewhere. I don't know wh right, what it right. is, but this story just doesn't make sense. And from that point on, all the chance encounters and the coincidences and the happen to run by each other. Mm -mm, no, that that cousin of hers, she was I don't know if the cousin was in cahoots with her the whole time to make this happen or she just was using the cousin or maybe right. he was using because this was a friend of both Mary and, and his as well. So like somehow there was a connection there. There could have been other times before that the, that Robin was up. And just like you said, he got to know her then he knew she was mm -hmm. getting out of the marriage eventually. And so this all happened. And then he played Mary to make right. her think that she was meeting her for the first time and thought, oh, this might be a good match for you, Cody. Yeah. And all of a sudden, guess whose idea it was? Mm-hmm. 100%. You know, I, yep. Guess whose idea it was? Once I again, wanna... just like coming into polygamy, it keeps coming right. up where all of a sudden it's all it's the wife's idea, not mine. You know, I had nothing right. to do I with was... this. And that was actually one of the things he had said is that when he talks about his being uh, introduced to Robin, he said how disgusted and put off he was by her because she was a single mom and she had kids and she was a divorce saying, oh, I didn't want to be a part of that situation with the minivan. And then Mary convinced me to do it. Yeah. Funny how that worked. And, mm -hmm. like, and I will say this, like the, the dynamic of uh, ladies and ladies, will be able to attest to this. If they're attracted to a guy and maybe they don't want to be the first one to make the move, like just old school stuff. Yeah. They will put themselves in a position mm -hmm. where the guy can interact with them with the least bit of uh, effort. Yeah. So like you'll be sitting at the bar and all of a sudden you turn around and she's sitting right next to you mm -hmm. or she's ordering a drink, you know what I mean? Right over your shoulder. Mm -hmm. And for some reason you guys have to have that interaction. Even like what you said, you know, all of a sudden you just find yourself behind him at the church mm -hmm. and if he's not turning around and giving you enough attention. Mm -hmm. you, get, you know, you give him a little show. Let's keep it all the way in stack. You give him the yeah. show. So you get up, you walk past him and then you give him the look over the shoulder to make sure he's checking out the goods. Yeah. Like that's what it sounds like to me. And maybe, yeah. you know, I'm not a, a most, uh, 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 you know, uh, prudent person. Like I'm not like living a life. So I don't know. <laughs> it just strikes me as that's kind of what it sounds like to me. Yeah. You know no, hundred percent. I, mean? I can picture myself, which is funny because I can think of examples of that, but they're all high school, but that's kind of the maturity Ooh. level that this whole right. group it's is functioning right. at. But yeah, like I just happen to walk home. I go by the baseball field because X right. is practicing. So that's my new route home. I used to go <laughs> jogging and there was another guy I was interested and I knew he lived on this block. Three miles away. I was in such great shape that year. My my jog would always be down his street. You know, like right. so. Yeah, I'm on to you, Robin. I, you know, right. I've been there, done you that. Know. Yes, yes. And all of a sudden, you just happen to be wearing your good mm -hmm. outfit when you just happen to be jogging. Mm -hmm. and exactly. Your hair happens to be done, and your makeup happens to be perfect. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Wearing the cutest outfit, and yeah. Right. hundred right. percent. Yeah. That's so, really what yeah, went down. I can see that. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, when you mentioned that Mary said, when I first noted Coast in church, our church group is quite close knit and has been together a long time. Any new face really stands out is just another testament to bring it back to when we were talking about 
nobody noticed her until she started hanging right. out with Cody. It's her own words. We are a close knit group that's been right. together for a very long time and any new face would really stand out. But then she goes on to say, nobody's ever noticed me right. or paid attention to me before. And so, oh, I just, I, in that regard, every now and then I go through these periods of my heartbreaking for Mary because right. I, you just kind of read between the lines and just think, well, she just must have been so incredibly lonely. And I think probably incredibly awkward at the mm -hmm. same time and didn't know how to how to get out of it. But when you read that and you realize, my goodness, you were how old and nobody knew who you were. They thought you were the new guy's sister. And you right. admit that you're a close knit group that's been there and they didn't even recognize you. I'm like, it just blows my mind. Yeah, it's it, it actually uh and this is again, this is no shot on Mary, not at all. But it, it reminds me of uh like those stories you would hear of like the uh like you'd have the, the jocks or whatever, they would take a picture and it'd be somebody kind of leaning in yes. to the picture. They're not <laughs> with the group, but they're with the group. You know, they just want to be a part of the group, but they're not a part of the group. Yeah. And that's what that kind of feels like to me. Like she's a member of the church, she's a part of the community, but she feels like she has to lean in yeah. to the pictures when they're taking the pictures because they're all doing their own thing as a, a yeah. group or as a organization, yeah. which is, again, it's a, uh, it's a sad situation. I, I mean, I'm not sitting there saying I feel sorry for Mary per se. Like I feel for her situation. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, everybody goes through things. Sometimes you have to go through things so that you can be where you need to be at the mm -hmm. time. Like Mary, I'm sure is very happy with the person that she is now. Mm -hmm. And I think that, by her getting with Cody, maybe that's what she needed. Mm -hmm. And this actually kind of goes to something that I've always believed that not everybody, you know, it's, a, it's an old saying, mm -hmm. uh, not everybody is in your life uh, for a lifetime. Some people come into your life for a season. So mm -hmm. you just have to be able to, you have to have the wisdom to be able to differentiate the people mm -hmm. who are lifetime people and people who are there for a season. They're there for a season and they're there for a reason. And they're, to, they're there to teach you a certain thing or let you experience a certain thing. And then after you have experienced it or after you learned it, it's time for you to move on yeah. from that relationship and so, as opposed to marrying it and then standing with it for 30 years and not necessarily fulfilling yourself. Yeah. So, so it's like, um, as you described that, it made me think that Mary lived a life of photo bombing, basically. <laughs> She's kind of like jumping into situations, <laughs> right? <laughs> going back out. I know I wasn't invited, but <laughs> here I am. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody's wearing red, she there with red on, but it's not the outfit. Like you right. know, what I mean, it is. It is. I can see it, and it, and people who are painfully shy, I understand that perspective as well. Like I'm not a person who's painfully shy at all yeah but i can understand that and i understand like i'm one of those people who i understand my oddity like i'm okay with getting up in front of a like a room full of five thousand people i could if there's a microphone i'm willing to speak i get excited about it oh five thousand people <laughs> and they have a microphone and stuff <laughs> but you know for the average person they will be horrified with the perspective prospect of maybe doing public speaking they don't want to speak in front of 20 people in the classroom with people that they grew up with. I understand that. And, and so from that respect, I can see the vulnerability of somebody who is experiencing that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden they're exposed to the other side, something that they've always dreamed of. Because, mm -hmm. you know, who hasn't had that dream where, you know, you become famous or you become this yeah. person that everybody wants to know? Yeah. And you all of a sudden you're the you're the, the man, you're the woman that right. everybody wants to get to know and be friends with. Yeah. And when she's with Cody, she gets to experience that. She mm -hmm. gets to be that person. Mm -hmm. You get to be the one. And you're yeah. with this person who is, you know, fl fluttering around the group. And that's my friend. Yeah, I'm here with them. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I'm I'm popular with uh, through my association with this person. So I can see that too. And it, it just makes me sad that she didn't get the opportunity to experience that herself at a time when she was in her developmental years. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. So she became very uh, vulnerable to Cody mm. and his outgoing personality. 
And I know to very shy people, that's very attractive too. a lot of them. It's not like they want to be with other shy people. They like to be with the person who can carry on the conversation. They, the, the, the stress and the responsibility of having to maintain a conversation and, and be in those social situation is taken off. If you can be with somebody else who's going to do that for you and you can still kind of just be in your comfortable, I'm just not going to say a whole lot in this situation here. I mean, you see Mary do that kind of throughout the seasons, whenever, she goes back to that. You know how sometimes she does this when she's she like turns into a little girl when she has to right. tell them like when she's like, um, I want to go to college. And then it was right. the same thing. Like, I want to take Solomon on a trip. And she just starts writhing her hands and she's like goes down to that shy little child that's still right. still in her because she's you know found her voice since she got married and you know has 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 grown out of that but it's interesting i can see that personality in those situations when she seems to revert back and she's scared to share what she's really thinking with them right okay susan q hey susan q How hey, you susan doing? Q. Okay. James and Jenny, great show. Enjoy the perspectives. Hope there will be more of these. We will. That's the plan. That's the plan. That's the plan. But thank you very much, Susan Q. Yeah, and I think that's actually an interesting point that you uh, point out. Susan Q is awesome. Um, yeah, my chat is is, is off the hook. They're amazing. <laughs> Gotta give a shout out to the chat and to the minds for holding it down. J Baby. Uh, oh, Lori Karad on there. Mm-hmm. Everybody's uh, holding it down. So appreciate you guys. Mm-hmm. Lizzie B, everybody. But um, it, it's kind of one of the points that you point out. Like the, uh, you can see see when people cert, suffer certain traumas that they'll revert back to a certain position. Mm-hmm. Even like you know what I mean. And almost in some in some extreme cases, and this isn't from like a professional thing. This is just what my experience. Mm-hmm. That in some cases they'll revert back to the the age that they were. Mm-hmm. Almost regress to the age that they were when they suffered that trauma, mm-hmm. and they take on that personality. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of it's it's very uh, at least for me it's it's a little telling that she reverts back to a very young yeah age when yeah. she goes back because like you said I've I've noticed that too mm-hmm. like she'll do the uh, thing and she and looks up like this. Thing. You know, right. she like looks down and just looks up. She can't even lift her head when she's talking to them. Right, it's almost mm-hmm. a pleading, and it and it's mm-hmm. the, and there's that uh that that lessening. She diminishes herself in order to mm-hmm. you know give them that. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I, I don't want to say that, but it's it's almost like uh there's there's certain uh, times even in nature where you see uh one 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 uh like an animal will come to another animal and they'll reveal themselves a vulnerable soft belly mm-hmm. uh, to show that they're not a threat. Yeah, and. It, and that's kind of what that puts me in mind. I'm not saying that Mary's an animal, but it just kind of puts me in mind of that, that it's a way for you to show them that you're not a threat to them. Right. You know? Yeah. And so there, there's a point where you say, well, that's her being powerful, recognizing her power. Is it or is it her reverting back to that to show yeah. that she's not a threat yeah. and she's not challenging their authority in any way? Yeah. And is that a result of her being beat down during the course of the marriage, being beat down as a child? Or is it just the insecurities and things that she was dealing with as she was coming up? Yeah. And so it's just like in a way, like I think that there's a lot of Mary gets a, uh and I and I've written Mary. I'm I'm not even gonna pretend like I'm I'm above it. I've written Mary pretty hard in some of my videos. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I have too, but this last year I started I I was floundering. Season 18. I haven't liked Mary right. and I made it very clear. She was always my least favorite. I just right. I, from everything about her, the way she speaks, the uh, kind of aggressiveness sometimes, and then and then the baby thing other times, and like I just felt like I can't get my hand on her, and I felt like she was just so incredibly immature and had such a difficult time with communicating. And as a speech language pathologist, I I have sympathy for that, but then sometimes I just have frustration with it. Right. <laughs> I just want to go get it together. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> over the years that's where she's been with me i just always my least favorite and then season 18 was when i felt like she was for the first time more vulnerable more honest 
sharing some of her really, you know, she was so closed off for so much of the show. It didn't help to, you know, you can't, can't like somebody who you don't know and don't get to know at all. You know, Christine was easy to get to know right away because her emotions, she just like was out there with them. Um, and, and Mary didn't. So this year I've, I've taken a reprieve on my, I, I, I hate Mary the most. And it's so funny if you go back and watch my bit. And I only started my channel like around episode 10 in this past um, season. But from there on, you can see all my videos are kind of like, Mary's driving me crazy. Why she can't together? <laughs> you know, they'll talk about the catfishing thing. And I'm like, of course she was having an affair with that. And then the next video, I'm like, oh, poor Mary. I just can't believe <laughs> Just, I completely flip flopped, and I'm the first to admit it. Uh, this season, I'm all mixed up about Mary, and it, I'll probably, it'll probably be the same thing all the way through this book. We'll all read certain passages and have complete sympathy and empathy for her, and then other times she will drive me absolutely crazy, and I'll revert back to where I was the last 17 seasons. <laughs> oh, James, you're silent. You went on mute. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. That's okay. Thank you. Um, I think that her story is interesting from the perspective of she has undergone a lot of humiliation, even at the hands of Cody. Like, mm. they had the whole ring thing, the ring gate yeah. uh, came out uh, during this season where they talked mm. about the ring and all that. And it, it's a lot of humiliation that she's endured yeah. uh, from at the hands of Cody. And again, I, that's it's it's weird because Cody has always kind of put out that she was the aggressor and she was the one who made him feel a certain kind of way and she beat him down. But there were a lot of things that he did, especially when Robin came into the family that was that was just out of pocket. Mm -hmm. Like taking your mar your wedding ring and melting it down yeah. for a uh, scrap is insane. Like mm -hmm. you I've heard of situations where people take their ring and they'll launch it across the street and throw it down a sewer hole, but mm -hmm. I've never heard of somebody taking it to a jeweler to melt it down. Right. Like to just completely obliterate the symbol, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. like you might lose the symbol, you might throw the symbol away, but to it completely obliterate it, that's just mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. You know, that's too much gas being spent, gas money being spent. But he did that. Yeah. And that's one of the things that, like I said, there's, there's a lot to marry mm -hmm. that I think that uh, kind of goes uh, missed because of her personality and because of the way she comes off. Mm -hmm. She comes off uh, too strong for you to feel bad for her at some points, yeah. but then she comes off so uh, vulnerable mm -hmm. at other points that mm -hmm. you you, you kind of feel that anger. Like, you need to get mad. I need to see the old Mary. Yeah. Where's Mary? Everybody's scared. Yes. Of her. You know, lay into him. You know, yes. don't let him do you like this. And so it's a conflict. It's conflict. Yeah. I get it. It's interesting when you mentioned too that whole like when she that oftentimes when people act like that they're reverting back to a person that age. It makes me wonder. She was three years old when didn't I say she was three when they moved to from California to Utah, right? And then she was five when they took when they became a um, when they took on another wife. Is that correct? Was she about five? Yes. And then that yeah, one lasted. On the first wife. Yeah, and then that lasted. So I feel like. I wonder if something during that whole time was really traumatic mm. for her. Like maybe right. she wasn't consulted on this. Maybe she didn't understand what was happening. Maybe, you know, like, but, but that does seem to be about that age that she acts like, because after that, right. the first wife, wasn't she 10 before the rest of the wives yeah. all started coming and then all the kids coming and all that. And and by then she wouldn't have been like acting that way. So it's interesting that you say that James, because it makes me wonder what happened from the time that they left California and moved to Utah and then, you know, had that first wife, what in there was traumatic. Cause she doesn't, she makes it seem like it was all grand and, and fine, but I find that hard to believe. Yeah. Well, cause even with that, it could just simply be that she opened up her heart and accepted the, other mother and then she feels mm -hmm. a certain level of abandonment because yes. all of a sudden you have a mom and you accept mm -hmm. her wholeheartedly and you mm -hmm. welcome her as a parent and then for whatever mm -hmm. reason you know basically she suffered a divorce yeah you know, in, in that situation yeah there's an interesting point too i can't I, I forgot to write it down where it is in the book but there's something that cody had said that uh when he talks about his dad getting a uh you know letting him know that well, the mom, his mom, again, his mom informed him that they were taking on an additional wife. Mm -hmm. And he says that uh, 
he said that, oh, yeah, my mom let me know that they were taking on an additional wife. And at that moment, I realized that I needed to uh, love and respect this woman because she was going to be my father's wife. Mm -hmm. And that struck me because it was almost like he was speaking to the other wives and other kids about Robin. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like, you need to love and respect him because I chose the same way my father chose mm -hmm. this woman, and I needed to love and respect her because my father chose to marry her. Mm -hmm. and I choose to marry somebody else. Mm -hmm. You need to give her all due respect and love because that's who I chose to be with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? And he did feel that way, didn't he? He really yeah. felt like those kids did not give uh, Robin her just due, even though it I, you never really saw anything blatant or tear. I mean, I just think she really wanted to be elevated by the wives as well as the kids. And when they right. just treated her like another person, she didn't really like it because nobody was treating her badly. They no, just no. weren't treating her like the queen that Cody was treating her like, and Cody wanted everybody to treat her like the queen too, that he saw her as. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, cause she's special to me. So you guys have to see a special. Mm -hmm. And they're mm -hmm. like, no, she's just one of the crew. <laughs> yeah. 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 And we expect that. And it's kind of weird too, because it, it comes down to uh expectation because mm -hmm. she expected to be treated at a, at a certain level with mm -hmm. a certain regard. Mm -hmm. Whereas everybody else said, we expect you to pull your own weight. Mm -hmm. We expect you to pull your weight. When you join the family, you're a member of the family. Mm -hmm. It's kind of that uh, old saying, like when you go over to your friends, your long friend's house, mm -hmm. when you first meet somebody, you go over to their house, they may offer you something to drink or something to eat when you get there, some type of refreshment. Mm -hmm. But if it's a friend that you had forever, and you say, uh, pardon me, could I get something to drink? Man, you know what a refrigerator is. Yeah, you know what <laughs> Get that. I ain't waiting on you. You know, what I mean? <laughs> you know, and I think that that's it. They're expecting you to pull your weight because you're a part of the family now. You part yeah. of the family, so yeah, you can go in my fridge. Go ahead, knock yourself out. Have, have at it, house. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that that's where the wives were when, when she came into the family. They expected her to pull her weight. They expect, mm -hmm. You're one of the family now, so mm -hmm. I get to talk to you, and I don't have to, you know, tiptoe around you and yeah. pretend like your feelings are so special. You are one of the family. And if mm -hmm. anything, you know, using the term, you're my sister. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk to you like I would talk to my sister. How I talk mm -hmm. to these two, I'm going to talk to you too. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. that she just doesn't like it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, wait till we get to the Robin chapter. Yeah, I know. That's going to be a hot be a five but, hour live. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, uh, well, we could call it here because okay. I know some folks got to get up. But that, do, you guys, do you have anything going on that you wanted to tell people about? Anything coming up? I just have, I'm reading through it, through it live on Thursday nights, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So my channel is Senior Perspective, um, which I actually added on Sister Wives because I moved to my sub channel all the rest of the reviews that I do. So Senior Perspective. Um, on Sister Wives is the name of my channel. And um, Thursday nights, random videos come out, but Thursday nights are when I do the live read because I never read the book at all before I got it. So um, it, it takes a few hours to get through it because it's a lot of commentary, a lot of talking. I try to break it all up. I don't read much um, at one given time. And we talk about it in the chat and whatnot. So everybody's welcome. I hope you join on Thursday night. Awesome. Awesome. All right, fantastic. And just to let everybody know, uh, oh, big shout out before I get into that. I want to give a shout out to uh, Lord Karad, uh, Lizzie B, Rochelle J, J Baby, all the mods, all the people who showed up. Thank you guys so much because otherwise it'd just be yes. me and Jenny. Not that I wouldn't mind talking to Jenny. But, Thank you. <laughs> you know, I appreciate you guys coming in and hanging out with us. Yes. Um, but what what I have coming up uh, tomorrow, I have the uh, was it OG three of reality TV. We'll be getting together with uh, Sarah and Amanda, reality Amanda. Those are great. Uh, so we have that tomorrow at seven, and then this week I will be releasing a video. I'm it's a uh, I'm I'm gonna refer to it as the open letter to Cody, where I'm just gonna give my thoughts on like his situation on where he is now and how hopefully he might be able to to put those relationships back together. So I'm calling it the open letter to Cody. So look for that. It'll be coming out this week. I like but, that. I like yeah, that. 
We, that's a, we shall see. Yeah, that's a great idea. I love it. Yeah. But uh, thank you guys all so much for hanging out with us. Did yeah. you have anything else you want to say? Nope, that's it. Other than thank you so much, James, because this has no, been no. a ton of fun. And I've really been looking forward to it all week. And, and <laughs> it, you live up to the expectations and beyond. It's been a whole lot. It's been just a pleasure to be here. So thanks. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate you. And I appreciate you coming in and playing with us. Like I said, uh, usually the chat is on fire. It looks like you guys are on fire having a good time, mm -hmm. which is always uh, fantastic. That's I appreciate it. And to my chat, I appreciate you guys, or our chat, I appreciate you guys keeping it positive and keeping it yeah. fun. Again, YouTube should be a place where you go to relax and enjoy things, not where you sit there and stress out. You should, you should yeah. not be stressed on YouTube at all. No. <laughs> that no. defeats the whole purpose. Yeah. You know, so. I appreciate everybody keeping things chill and all the mods and everybody holding it down. But yeah. thank you guys so much for uh, Jenny. <laughs> and I'm James. This has been my take on reality. Thank you guys Bye. for coming. See you later. <laughs> all right. <laughs>